Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? <laughs> Let me tell you. Welcome to Texags. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Welcome back to Texags Stack. I'm Billy Lucci. Olin Buchanan. Make a mistake. We're not going anywhere. This is going to be a great program, and we're building into a great program. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I stand by what we do and how we do it. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like, that's about as cool a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man. Right? 50-50 ball, I got to come down with it. If I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. I feel like I've started these segments kind of similarly recently. We got the quarterback, guys, and and there's a reason I started it off with that. It is Texax Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. I'm David Nuno. He's Olin Buchanan. He's our Heisman Trophy voter. He is our columnist. He is my buddy. OB. Yes, sir. We always talk about how important the quarterback is, okay? Yes. And, and there's reasons. I mean, we, there's tangible reasons for it. I'm going to give you some numbers. So Cade in the back came up with a great segment idea. The last 10 national championship winning quarterbacks and their QBR. As you know, okay. right now, Connor's, what, number two in the country? I, think I've, it, I've read that. Yep. In 2022, are you familiar with Stetson Bennett? I am. He was number six in the country in QBR. Excellent. In 2021, Sesson Bennett. Are you yeah, familiar with that? I am. Number Same three. Guy. Yeah. 2020, Mac Jones, number one. Yeah. 2019, Joe Burrow, number one. One. I can't imagine anybody was better. No, 2018. And by the way, I don't think, uh, I'll tell you who it is. Trevor Lawrence, Trevor number Lawrence, eight. Of course. And he was a dual threat kind of dude, right? right? Okay. 2017. Are you familiar with Jalen Hurts? I, I am, unfortunately. He's number seven. Okay. 2016, a guy that we may bring up later. A guy by the name of Deshaun Watson, number five. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because it was a different football, I think, in 2015. Jake Coker was the uh, – yeah. his number was 32. They had an amazing defense. They did. And, and, and some guy named Derrick Henry, I believe. Pretty good at football, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty good. And then 2014 – JT Barrett, number two. Okay? And in 2013, the last year we go back, because we're looking at 10 years, Jameis Winston, which was number one. Correct. So with the exception of Coker, every national championship team has had a top 10 QB in terms of QBR. I'd like to see Connor stay in that top 10. I'd like to see him stay in that top five. And what I'm saying is, with that, you've got a chance. So you're telling me there's a chance. Look, I'm... Hey, I got a number for you. It's more of a trivia question. You know, if if uh, if Connor throws for three hundred yards against Auburn, that'll be three consecutive three hundred yard games. Do you know who was the last A and M quarterback to have three consecutive three hundred yard passing games? I'm gonna go. So I'm assuming Kellen never did it. Johnny. Corey Pulling. No. Who is not, Kenny Hill. Kenny the Thrill. Okay, Kenny, Kenny Trill. Hill. In 2014. Johnny did it in 2013. Okay. But so it's been like nine years. And so I went way back. I was way wrong. Okay. Well, you said Johnny. You know, you're thinking about it. That, that, but I was thinking that it was was a, cool. there, was a, there was like maybe a trick to but, the question. But, I mean, nine years. It's a long time. It's a long time for uh, three consecutive 300-yard games. So I had something to keep an eye on this weekend. Yeah. No, look. He is playing at a very high level, and he is doing it in multiple ways, which is the part that I really like. Because you could have a very efficient quarterback that all he does is dump, right? Mm-hmm. Short. Yeah. How often are we seeing Connor go down the field and complete those passes? I think um, what's really impressive is that two part here is that Connor is looking to throw for a big play. You know, he's not just taking check downs all the time. He's looking for the big play um, and doesn't throw a lot of interceptions. 
because usually it's the guys that are throwing down field a lot uh, get interceptions. Mm-hmm. You know, they have more interceptions. Uh, they're, they're lower percentage and things. Johnny had like 13 interceptions one year. And a big part of that was, hey, yeah, going for the big play. Yeah. Uh, so, so you understand it because the risk is – it's kind of high risk and high reward, but a guy like that, you get the payoff more often, you know, the, the, then you get the interception. But like in that game the other day, six, six intercept, I mean, six 20 yard passes or more in one, in, in less, and barely a half. Right. Just a little bit more than a half, no interceptions. And again, you look at his two interceptions, they were both really on short passes. Yeah. Um, and again, those, the turn, how, how many games has he started now? I think he started seven. Seven games. Seven. He's had two turn or two interceptions in those seven games. Right. And Played eight, started seven. And one of them we've discussed, not his fault. The other, yeah, it's his fault, but it's not his fault, right? Like, it's, I, I hate well, to make a justification, but there's he's very good protecting the football. That's the bottom line. And he was, yeah, he is. He's very good protecting the football. That's right. Ob, I'm going to try a little segment with you I, um, here as I try to learn to speak English on the program. It is called Turbulent Times. So I want you to think about teams that are either in the middle of some turbulent times. Because I got a couple t- I'm going to throw at you. Um, or in the middle of turbulent times or turbulent times are coming. And I'll start it off. Okay. okay. The team a- uh, A&M is going to play this weekend, Auburn. Auburn. They might be heading into some turbulent times. And let me explain to you why. Okay. They've got a road game against A&M. Mm-hmm. Then they've got Georgia. Mm-hmm. Then they got LSU. The, this amazing story through the non-conference for this team by amazing, they're 3-0. and and, But it could get real rocky real quickly mm-hmm. um, considering what these next three games do. Because I think they're riding high coming in the cop field because they are undefeated and there is a... There's a swagger and a, a, a confidence that happens no matter who you play when you're winning games. What is the reverse of that when you lose potentially three straight? This is a and, – and look, life in the SEC, you could say that about any team. But I'm talking about the team that was by many predicted to be last or close to last. They're feeling really good about themselves. Some people had them, maybe they can win the West. Well, we're, they're about to get, I think, a dose of reality over the next three weeks. Uh, I think so. I th- they're going to be – underdogs in all three games just as they were favored to win um the first three no one i think is surprised that they won their first three mm-hmm. the only game that was supposed to be in question was cal and it was in question and they were very fortunate to win it but they did the made the plays they had to make so yeah with uh that upcoming schedule they're mm-hmm. they're gonna have to prove something well there you go well it actually goes beyond a&m georgia and lsu yeah because you got Ole miss, miss right, right, right after that, that. Maybe Mississippi State's going to be a break based on the way they played last. Vandy should be a break. Well, you certainly hope so if you're Auburn. Yeah, and, and look, my next team is that team right after Vandy on that list. Arkansas, a team A&M is going to play here in a couple of weeks. So they, they just lost to BYU. Mm-hmm. And I think m- most people probably had them winning that game. I did. Right? Then they get LSU. Yeah. Then they get A&M. Mm-hmm. All right? I believe. And then Ole Miss and Alabama both on the road. Right? So, again, that is life in the SEC. But I'm just talking about for this next stretch, it's about to get real for them. At LSU. Mm -hmm. At LSU, right? A&M, who's dominated them 10 out of the last 11 times. to Dominate the wins. The wins, yeah. Yeah, not the the, the score total every time. But it's about to get turbulent for, for Arkansas, I believe. Or they can turn their season around. Uh, absolutely. Um, hey, you know, th- that's why when people would call me uh, from other outlets and have me on their podcast or their radio show and they'd say, oh, I want this stretch of A&M, you know, how, how they can get through that. They're going to get through it the best they can, just like everybody else in the SEC. Show me that team that doesn't have a stretch of three or four games that's going to be treacherous. And go, one guy said, oh, yeah, I guess you got a point. Like, why do you need me to tell you that? You've been following this league longer than me. It's just what it is. But, yeah, well, that's, a, that's a heck of a stretch coming up for Arkansas. A&M's got a tough stretch coming up, too, because, you know, beyond what they have SEC-wise here over the next couple of weeks, and we'll find out who the real Alabama team is here. Well, that's a team in turbulence. Well, that's the, the next team I had on that because not only did they lose to Texas, almost, almost lose to South Florida. They, they could have lost. They could game. have lost. 
They're on the road at Ole Miss. Now, I don't know. Is it at Ole Miss? I'm actually, I think it is. I'm not really sure about Ole Miss yet, and right. I don't think we – But we got a pretty good idea they can score. Yes, and I, we don't feel very good about Bama scoring at the moment. Not at the moment, even though I don't feel real good about Ole Miss's defense either, so that might be an interesting game to watch. Yeah, but would you have felt I – don't, I don't know enough about South Florida to feel – you know, either way about them. It's just uh, Alabama's offense has well, struggled. But uh, with Jalen Milrow, they'll be better. They, they will be better. It's To, to me, it's bewildering that uh, they saw what they saw. Nick Saban once changed quarterbacks in a national championship game at halftime, and the first guy wasn't that bad. Right. Uh, to me, it's bewildering that they – watch what they saw last week and then say, oh, they didn't realize Milrow was, was their guy and put him in earlier. Yeah, so those or are – at all, I should say. Those are teams that I see in, in turbulent times. And next week, we'll probably be talking about some of the same teams. Um, there might be a new one because – You know what's one on a national level? Well, tell me, tell me more. Clemson? Colorado. Oh, because they got Oregon? And then USC. Got USC. After, after escaping Colorado State. Who does Clemson have this weekend? I feel like it's a big game. Uh, is it Florida State? Is it Florida yes. State? Yes, it is. Thank you for saying it so uh, quietly. It is Florida State. Um, yeah, what a great – I mean, just a great week of college football. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. It's amazing matchups this week. And later on in the hour, we're going to guess the spread with Luke. He's going to throw us some games. We have to, like – I don't look at that stuff. You probably do. I don't. You're, you're a gambling geezer. Of course you're looking at it. Well, you know what? I really don't because I'm too busy doing other things. Yeah. Yeah. When we do that podcast, Gambling Geezers, I know the line when Sam Hop tells me. Right. All right. Let's, uh, by the way, if you want to be part of the conversation, you can text us 979 693 1150. That is the phone number. You can text us. You can call us. You can do whatever you want with that number. Let's go say hi to the people out there. We go behind the glass and we say hi to Nick Savage. Nick, good morning, buddy. Howdy. Good morning, y'all. How are you, man? I'm great. I'm great. How are y'all doing? I'm doing well, buddy. Good. Well, just something I want to touch on real quick, going back to, to Connor, is I feel like I know we have spoken about it, but it kind of gets overlooked because he doesn't really run that much. But Connor also has that big playability on the ground. Yep. Uh, we've seen him take off on. I I thought he was rushing for longer plays, but uh, against New Mexico, his long was 17 yards. Miami was 13, and ULM was 19. But still, I mean, they, they always come – when you know in a big spot it seems like on a third down or something like that and that's just a welcome sight yeah. for me off the top of my head i would look i would say even if you went back to last year he's probably 80 85 percent picking up the first thing if you look at how many times he's actually run and then say how many times have those runs resulted in a first down or a touchdown i top i could be dead wrong on this but I, it just strikes me it's 80 to 85 percent success rate yeah uh, I'm going to read this here on the uh, YouTube chat. Hey, can you subscribe to YouTube, please? We're trying to get those numbers up. We're almost at uh, 11,000. Still not quite there. This is from the Sheriff ESQ. Auburn has a great DC, a good pass rush, and solid DBs. Not going to be easy. Nobody's saying it's going to be easy. Nobody says it's going to be easy. But you should, be, you should win. Here's what I would say to that. Um, do, do we know that that they have a great pass rush because having a great pass rush against UMass and Cal and whatever, whatever punching bag they played last week, I've already forgotten. Um, is that, is it going to translate to being a good pass rush in SEC play? I don't know. I don't know. One thing we haven't seen is a pass rush from A&M. Right. It does not mean that there won't be ones that starts getting generated because two of the opponents were quick or running the ball. Right. But, but if, you, if you, that said, if you can't protect the passer, though, I mean, if you can't get to the passer against ULM. You're probably not going to get to the passer. Well, why do I think yeah. I'm going to get to it against the SEC? Teams? And I think Peyton Thorne's a pretty good runner. Well, he was in that game. Uh-huh. He wasn't that game. He had 120 yard. Who did they play last week? I, I know it was a. I know it was Stanford. Yeah, I know it was a cupcake. Uh, if you'll go back and look at his running through his career, it hasn't been anything to really speak of. 
All right, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. The Angry Elephant, like your politics, love your bar. Find an Angry Elephant near you in Bryan, College Station, Magnolia, San Antonio. By the way, we're going to be at the Angry Elephant this Friday, broadcasting our show a Friday morning from the Angry Elephant in South College Station. So they usually open up at 11 a.m. They're opening up at 8 a.m. for our show. And like did, you can actually uh, you can go, go eat. In there. You can go get, uh-huh. get your eat on. They gave hey, me it's a, 5 o'clock somewhere, right? It's 5 o'clock somewhere. We're going to have to have to use that as uh, some buffer music. But go on. You're going to be there. Of course. I'm going to be there. God willing, and the creek don't rise. The SEC Shorts crew is going to be there because they're performing this really? weekend. Yeah, they're going to be there. Okay. How about that? Uh, who else do we have going there? Oh, are you familiar with Billy Lucci? Yes. Okay, he'll be there. He's in The Godfather, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, which one is he? He's not uh, Fredo, is he? Didn't he sleep with the fishes? That's uh, Luca Brasi. Oh, no, so it wasn't Billy Lucci. Uh, and then we have, uh, oh, the McKinney Brothers, the final oh, countdown, yeah. all at the Angry Elephant. They've got uh, the Hangover Burger. I'm looking th- through their... Uh, Menu: The bad bougie fried egg sandwich, the freedom toast, a little bit of chicken fried steak and eggs. I mean, a lot of great stuff that they're going to have there. So make sure you go by the Angry Elephant this weekend. Say hi to the crew. Yeah, come by and say hi to us. Olin will absolutely. I won't with even you. be angry. You'll he'll do Except shots with hair. you. My hair is sticking up in the back. You know, Earl likes it to be uh, long now, but I'm not comfortable with this. It's going all crazy. How long are you going to go? I don't know. I feel like until she says. That she doesn't like it, I guess. I it feel is like long. I didn't realize you, you how know long those it was. Uh, pictures of Einstein, you know, with his hair going yeah. everywhere. I feel like I'm going that way, that direction. You kind of look like Einstein. Well, maybe I'm trying to get a. Uh, okay. Anyway, I'm sorry I made it about me. I can, look like a schnauzer. Can you do me a favor? What? In about I don't know a month, can we do the man bun? No, I'll never do. Come that. on, let's do. No, it. I'm t- come I, on. I have way too much testosterone. <laughs> let's for the man bun. <laughs> By the way, if you don't, I have a hookup for you later. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, <laughs> I as I talking. segue to Luke Evangelist on that line, I apologize. Luke, who probably has worn a man bun. Never. Never? Okay, no. I respect that from you, Luke. No. Good morning, buddy. Good morning, y'all. I've actually got a quick stat about Peyton Thorne. So he has 410 rushing yards in his career. 140 of that has come in these first three games at Auburn. So 34% of his rushing yards have been in these last three games. And he just had 120 the yes. other game? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so he is a capable runner, but he doesn't. He didn't he run doesn't that much run. at Michigan State. Is he like a Max Johnson runner? Yeah, I would put him in that same Max, athletic. Max can no, run. I bet he's not as good a runner as Max. Max, go back and watch that Arkansas game last year. Even, But he even made a heck of a move uh, – against ULM, but go back and watch that Arkansas game if you have any questions about Max's ability to run. You're right. We were giving him too much credit comparing him to Max Johnson. Well, I've got some stats about A&M. Uh, they're now 12-7 and seven after a loss under Jimbo, 8-3 and three at home. And there's been a lot of talk about the 11 a.m. kickoff. Some people don't like them. Well, Jimbo is 13-2 and two overall in 11 a.m. kickoffs, 8-1 and one at home, and 2-0 and oh at neutral sites. Obviously, we got uh, A&M has Auburn this week at home and then Arkansas next week yeah, at a neutral like site. And here's an interesting stat I found. I went and found um, his record in all different kickoff times. In 230 games, A&M is 2-10 and 10 under Jimbo Fisher. 2-10? and 2-10. and 10. Well, that's because at 11, you're typically playing a poor opponent. At 230, you're playing a really good opponent. Yeah, this is true. Well, over half of the 11 a.m. kickoffs were against SEC teams, and he's 13-2. Well, and two. But, but they're but typically yeah. not one of the higher calibers. Yeah, right. That's why you get at 11 o'clock. Because, hey, back-to-back know, back weeks at 11, eight, right? Am I right yeah, about that? Yeah, it's the home of the 12 Eastern Time man. Hey, you, look, <laughs> not that this is – like for partying, I don't think the 11 a.m. game is the best. For members of the media, not bad. Actually, here's who – the 11 a.m. kickoff, even though the stat Luke gave us would, would, would argue that, uh, typically you'll hear people say that is – better for the visiting team. Oh, is that right? Because they're not sitting around in a hotel all day. You know, hey, if I gotta be on the road, let's just go let's just go play. Certainly seen the workout for Florida last year. I don't know if you were listening. I assume you were when the McKinney brothers were here and they were uh complaining about going up on Thursdays for A and M. And like you're there all day. Like you're not like Yeah, it certainly isn't working. Yeah. I think that's something they ought to Reconsider? Reconsider, but if Jimbo's been doing it his whole life. Uh, yeah, but if it becomes a, if, if the trend continues, it's something that has to be examined. It has to. I mean, it already should have already been examined, but it has to. But we're not there right now. We're at a home game. Anything else, Luke, before I hit a break? Oh, well, uh, in night games, which is anything past a 530 kick, he's uh, 23 and 10. 
I gotta tell you, night. vamos a jugar. Yeah, I, I gotta I gotta give props to my guys because our our stats crew they have been doing such good work. Yeah. Like there's some information. Like I told them it was information overload because they made this incredible document. Like with all these things, like I I I just see a lot of numbers. Uh, but they've uh, they've put in some really good work there for uh, our, our content. All right, let's hit a break. All right, so if Fargo's was a start time for a football game, mm-hmm. what start time would you give them, Ob? Well, I would give them because it's interesting because you could go multiple no, ways no, here. I, I'm still giving them 11 a.m. start time. You know why? Why? Because I got to get there early for the rib tips. Let me give you a tip: the ribs, rib tips. But you know what? I couldn't. I, I really couldn't give you that tip because tip is something left over, right? So right. I, 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 uh, you eat it there'll all. be no leftover. I, I would eat all the rib tips. So how often do you have, when you go to Fargo's and you get a, a beautiful plate, one of their specials, how often do you leave a little bit of food? Because I've seen you at certain ne- restaurants. Never. Never. I never have. Never. And the person next to you that you're like. I mean, if you're going to consider like if there was some like a piece of onion. No, no, no. I'm, ta- was, I'm talking about If it was something rib. that once roamed the earth. Done. It's gone. Yeah. It's consumed. Oh. It disappears. It vanishes. And would, my belly. would you have it for breakfast? Oh, yeah, I have. I have. You've had? I've had food like that that I've kept for breakfast. Like maybe maybe the wife didn't finish hers and we right. brought it back. Like I've had rib tips before. You know, she doesn't eat as much as I do. Here's, here's a pro tip. She's a lot smaller than me. If you do have leftovers because your wife doesn't finish her plate or whatever, yeah. right? You can put it in your eggs in the morning, leftover. It's, it's been known to happen. It, it changes, but... Go enjoy Fargo's at 1701 South Texas Avenue. Uh, by the way, they have specials that run out early, as Olin said. Get there at 11 a.m. to make sure. Call early because once they're yeah, gone. They're gone. Well, they are the best. 1701 South Texas Avenue. Without a doubt, the what? It's the best barbecue in Texas, which, of course, means that's the best barbecue in the world because we have the world's best barbecue in our, in our humble state. And you know that's their trademark. Because it's true. It's Fargo's.
It's a good song right here. It's a great song. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Got us feuding like you know, Jamie McCoy. You know, they call me Mr. Country. Yeah, I know that. But My the country's Cuba, though. Well, <laughs> I've been jamming some country. It's not yeah. the country that you and... Well, I know some of it. I got some GB on my playlist. Yeah? Yeah. Some GB. Garth Brooks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. We had a conversation yesterday with Brent Zerman, and he was he was shocked to know that I'm not a big Garth Brooks fan. No? No. I, I've got uh, some... Who else have I got? I got the King. George Strait. Of course I got George Strait. Will Allen Jackson. Jorge Estrait. Yeah. Will Allen Jackson. Yeah. I do have Alan Jackson. Yes, I do. Brooks and Dunn. I do have some Brooks and yeah. Dunn. Yeah. W- Waylon Jennings. I don't have it on you my current playlist, but I do Jennings. like Waylon Jennings. And yeah. uh, Chris Stapleton. I love Chris Stapleton. But is he country or is yeah. he, he... He's country blues. He, he, he's everything. He, yeah, he's country that... that yeah, with a, with a broad appeal. I'm trying to find my... Because I'm... I'm I'm actually proud of it. My kids are like, Dad, you've got a lot more country than you – because I had zero before I moved back here to college. You ever listen to Merle Haggard? Of course. Good old Merle. Mama tried. Mama did try. Um, here, I'm just going to – Johnny cause, Cash. Just because I'm proud of it. My playlist, and I've already read part of it, but I've added to it since then. I got some Toby Keith on there. Mm-hmm. I got some uh, – you wouldn't like it. Morgan Wallen. I got Jason Aldean. Mm-hmm. Cole Swindell. I know that's not your, your department. Yeah, I'm more of an older – Luke? Coach. Team Cole Swind- Swindell or no? Uh, yeah, sure. Whatever no. you say. You don't know who that is, do you? No, I don't do country music. Oh, good for you. Sam Hunt? Is it, no, I know Nick hates him. Yeah, David, you should quit while you're, like, no. you're ahead here. Luke so. Combs, Eric Church. I don't care. I, like, think, I think Florida Georgia Line is going to be coming up here pretty <laughs> soon. No, they're not. They didn't, <laughs> sounds like they didn't make the list. And, of course, my buddy Zach Bryan. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's do a little Apex Performance of the Week. Can we do that, OB? We can. It is presented by Apex Health. Feel like you're losing your edge? It could be low testosterone. Increase your energy, sharpen your focus, and boost your performance with a custom treatment plan for Apex Health. Learn more at apexhealthclinic.com. They're owned and operated by a veteran serving the Brazos Valley. Should we do the easiest one? or You, you take the first one. Okay. I'm not going to do the easiest one. Okay. We all know what it is, but I'm going to do the guys that were... Uh, uh, contributing to the easiest one. Okay. And so I think you got to, I'm going to start with Jade Walker. Okay. Say, hey, I remembered his name. Jade. I've been saying number nine. Yeah. So All to, day Walker. So today it's Jade. What was he? Six catches? Five It's catches? right there. Right above oh, yeah. 110 yards. Uh, he had a 37 long, but he, I think he also had a 32. And he did it all in the first half. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, and here's a guy who's not a starter. He comes in. You know, when some guys are out, and he goes out and just kicks butt. When we talked about this receiving core, he was an unknown, right? Like right. It was like, we think he's going to be okay, but we didn't know. From Grand Valley State? Yeah. He's Which got I the, don't know anything about it. What other is he, than it's six, in a valley, and it's pretty grand. In his grand. Yeah. He's 6'3". Yeah. He's fast. Apparently, he likes to wear a turban. And he does the <laughs> duck dance? Yeah, he does. So, is and, that he, what and you know what? He, he can block a punt, too. The guy has done it all. He's been huge. I'm going to let you do another one, Obi. Uh, how about everybody's favorite number zero, Anaya Smith? Agent zero? Just going out and do, doing Anaya Smith stuff. Seven catches, 127 yards. Just, man, has there ever been anyone? Well, there has. Uh, you know, he's very Christian Kirk-like. Yep. Just goes out and, and, and just does great work. Yeah. He does what, it all. He does it. He does it all. He, he actually ran uh, – from the running back spot this Dude, last game. Look, I'm going to Returns, punts. He could be a cornerback if he you could needed be, him. Well, he may, they may need him to. You know, uh, um, Colorado, they've had the guy that's been playing both ways. Yeah. Maybe uh, Texas Hunter. A&M should – should start thinking about did that. Did you hear that the dude who did the late hit on him and whatnot yeah. is getting death threats? First of all, it was as dirty a hit as I ever saw. Yeah. But if there's any fan base, and a lot of Aggies will probably agree with me on this, that is is disgusting enough to make death threats, it's Colorado. and though, though, they, they, su- they suck. Colorado, you should be ashamed of yourself. Your fans are, are sub-Texas Tech. We've seen it. We've seen it firsthand. We've hand. lived it. We, we were there, and, and it wasn't even Boulder. It was freaking Denver. And people yeah. Were, I feel they, like were, they've been known to throw bags of urine at people. I, you might you might have well I'm not gonna tell you what I would do batteries I'd find them well yeah but it's kind of hard to do that when there's like no. maybe fifty thousand people no, I'd find them 
Yeah. Yeah. I got a special set of skills. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like Liam Neeson. <laughs> yeah. I'll go to the I'll go to the security room. Show me the tape. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna electrocute one. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Uh, they're a disgusting, repugnant group of fans at Colorado. I'll I'll I'll, I'll go on record saying that. Can we throw in a defensive player, if you don't mind in this? Uh, yeah, yeah. let's turn the page and go to a defensive player. Page turn. I think I turned it. Yeah, I turned it the right way. Shamar Turner. Oh, you, you, Turner of the page. That way we'd go back. Three sacks and three. So three sacks, had a sack in every game. What was he, our leading sack person last year? It was, uh, it was uh, Fidel Diggs. Fidel Diggs, three and a half. Had, I think he had more than that. He had three and a half. It was a three. No. Okay. Was he three and a half? Three and a half. Wow. And this dude's got three. Maybe not even the half. Might be just three. He had two against Alabama. He had one against uh, South Carolina and might have might have contributed one more. Of course, then he got hurt after South Carolina, but that's all. That was your, your number one guy last year. He had like three, three and a half. And this guy's got how many? Three. In how many games? In three. And, of course, he doesn't play all the time because A&M's always uh, rotating their guys in so much. But he's the one – He's the beacon of light in that in that dark pass rush. Well, he is. Uh, he's been phenomenal. And let's just do the lowest hanging fruit. Well, Connor Wickman. That's great. I mean, QBR. We just started the show with talking about his QBR right there. Uh, in this game, twenty five to twenty nine, three thirty seven, eighteen rushing yards, and it would have gone longer. I think the way. I mean, the way he was running, uh, and two touchdowns. Just awesome. Just uh, everything. He is. You know, every time you think, like, since I've been at this gig, and even before, like, you think these amazing things about these quarterbacks. And oftentimes, it takes a little while to get going. Like, Kellen it took a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. His senior years where he really took off. Mm-hmm. And he had some moments before that. No, Connor had hype coming into it. And through his seven starts, he's lived up to it. Well, he hit the ground running when he finally started, wasn't it, against uh, Ole, Miss. Ole Miss? And then he threw for, like, I don't, I don't know, was it 300 yards against Ole Miss? It was close if it wasn't. You know, four touchdowns. He was fantastic. Of course, you know, he didn't play well against Auburn, but against, nobody did. So, OB, he was one yard short of his career high against Ole Miss. It was 338 yards oh. last year. So, he missed that by a yard. Yeah. So, th- that's amazing in itself right there in that. So, he started, did we say seven games? Yes. And, and three of them, he's thrown for over 300 yards. And if he gets four? It'd be the first time since what you told since me? Since 2014. Kenny Hill. Kenny Hill. It's been a minute. All right, let's hit a break. We'll come back with Shereen Williams. Right now, I'm not exaggerating when I say that QC Kinetics can make you enjoy life again, guys. It can change your absolute life without living with that chronic joint pain, uh, without drugs, without surgery. They are advanced regenerative medicine that take your body's own concentrated healing properties and put them right back in that joint. And it makes it feel so much better so quickly, too, to restore and repair that damaged tissue that's causing all of that horrible pain. The patient satisfaction reports are astonishing. Finally, a real alternative to the old ways of dealing with pain. And unlike surgery, there's no downtime with QC Kinetics. If you have constant pain in your knees, your hips, your shoulder, or your back, you need to call and get a free consultation from the medical professionals there at QC Kinetics. And I'm telling you, you're going to love it because it's going to be quick and you're going to feel great. Imagine this fall moving pain-free, doing the things that you love again, walking, hiking, playing with the grandkids. Call QC Kinetics and see how the latest advances in precision regenerative medicine can attack that pain and bring you lasting relief. Call them up, 979-452-6000. QC Kinetics, 979-452-6000. That's 979-452-6000.
You like this one, don't you? That, I, I don't know. Maybe I like, not. I like, Maybe. All, I like all Bob Seger. Okay. Is there any Bob Seger song you like next? I think uh, he had a song called Strut that I thought was, eh, it's kind of a throwaway to me, but yep. I wasn't into it. But yeah, for the most part, I really, I really love his music. Very similar catalog to Bad Bunny. It's Tech Stacks Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. I just do that for effect, <laughs> even though it's true. Let's go to the hotline. Shereen Williams is with us, Pro Football Talk and Hall of Famer. Shereen, good morning. Good morning to you guys. How are you? I'm good. How are y'all doing? Doing well. I didn't get to chat with you, but I saw you working the rounds in the press box the other day. I'd love to uh, connect with you next time. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the A&M situation. The ULM game shouldn't make you feel completely better, but I do feel a little better. Is that is that kind of how you see it? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I just think this is a really good offense, missing two of the top receivers, and, and they still put up a ton of points and did some good things, I thought, offensively. And, you know, running the ball was okay. I, you know, I still worry about the pass rush. And unless you can get to the quarterback – you're going to give up a lot of yards, and you're probably going to give up a lot of points, and there are going to be a lot of games when they're going to have to outscore people. And, that, you know, that's just a hard way to live. they got to figure out a way to get the quarterback. I know they had one sack in that game. Is that the only sack they have this year? Uh, this year? I can't remember any others. Oh, they got more. Yeah, they don't have many. Yeah, uh, Turner has three, and, and in that game, Malik Sela was credited with one on right. a bad snap. Okay, so they got, what, four? That's, that's it, might, it might be I up mean, to five. It might be up to five. Okay. They got the Van Dyke twice. You, you, yes, they yeah, did get. Have, and one was, <laughs> one was uh, he was uh, running, and so it was one of those where Shamar Stewart kind of forced him out of bounds right. for a yard yeah. loss. So. Yeah. Right, right. It goes down as a sack, but yeah. My point is, you got to be able to get to the quarterback more consistently. Even if you don't get the sacks, the four throwaways. They're not getting to the quarterback consistently enough. That, that's not enough in three games. Right. And, you know, you, you see it some with Jadavion Clowney didn't have great sack numbers, but back when he first started with the Texans in his Pro Bowl year and those type of years, he didn't have huge sack numbers. Nine's the most sacks he's ever had, but he affected the quarterback. He was always back there and around the quarterback. You've got to at least have that. You've got to affect the quarterback. To me, this defensive line, do whatever, even when they blitz, they're not getting there. So they've got to be better at that. However they figure out, and it's obviously now it's got to be scheme. You know, it's not play. You're not going to get any new players to come in here, so it's got to be scheme. So they've got to scheme that better to get after the quarterback. So that, if there's a concern, it's me. And, I, you know, I, I went on Twitter on, on Saturday because early in that game, people were cr- criticizing this secondary. Secondary's a mess. Secondary's a mess. Okay, secondary has some problems, yes, but again, they can't cover all day. If the quarterback's going to be allowed, I don't care what quarterback it is. I don't care what team it is. If the quarterback's going to be able to stand back there all day and throw against the air, they're going to complete some passes because the corners can't cover that long. So you got to get to the quarterback better if they're going to win these SEC games coming up. Otherwise, it's going to be a track meet, and they're going to have to outscore. And and just that's just a hard way to live. Yeah, and yet, uh, well, I will not say what I was going to say about the three men rush, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I agree. I think they're going to have to start bringing. Uh, I think they're going to have to start consistently bringing a, a linebacker or a safety. They they brought Josh Berry on a corner blitz in the yep. first game for a sack, but they're going to have to get creative with that because uh, we've yeah. seen what happens when there's uh, when there's no pressure. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You, you've seen you've seen it, and you've seen it against some two bad quarterbacks have completed balls down the field or mediocre quarterbacks. And what do you want to call them? They're not good quarterbacks. Van Dyke, I think, is pretty good. But any quarterback, when they just stand back there and not get any pressure, is, is going to complete pass down the field. So, yeah, however you do that, which, it, which obviously going to have to be blitzes because they aren't getting there consistently with the line. Which is bewildering so to me. you have to be creative in how you get there. Because they have all these guys that everybody in the country wanted. And they're, yep. and they're not 
with that exception of Shamar Stewart. And McKinley Jackson doesn't get sacks, but sometimes he can get that push inside. But other than that, you're just not seeing it. Shereen, let's talk about a dominant yeah. defense in the NFL, those Dallas Cowboys. Micah Parsons, I was looking at these numbers. They get a pass rush. They the do. Way. Well, he does too. Two sacks, four quarterback hits, three tackles for a loss, a forced fumble, and a four, uh, fumble recovery. That sounds like a, a pretty good. Was that in the last game? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Sure, let's talk about this defense. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it harkens back to the doomsday defense of, of the yesteryear for the Cowboys. This defense is just playing outstanding right now. And if you start talking about MVP candidates, we're only two games in, I understand, and it's a 17 game season. Um, you got to talk about Mike Parsons as a potential MVP candidate. He's been that good in two games. He's been dominant. It's been unbelievable. The one, sorry, I'm not getting creative on blitzes. He came out of nowhere and like he was shot out of a cannon and great scheme by Dan Quinn to get him freed up to come straight through there. They had no idea where 11 was. And, and when, the, when the offense has no idea when, where 11 is, because you know they're keeping an eye on him, that tells you that the scheme was really good. And it was really good on that play. And, and uh, he roughed up Zach Wilson pretty good on that play. But, yeah, he's just playing outstanding. It, it's, a, it's a great defense. And guess what? Donovan Wilson hadn't even been out there yet. You're going to add him back to this defense. They're going to be even better because talking about blitzes, he comes off the edge as well as anyone I've ever seen. And he's just really good at that. So this defense is going to get even better when, when Donovan gets back out there. Who's the complimentary, the, the best complimentary rusher to uh, Micah Parsons? And and is uh, is Demarcus Lawrence still considered a – a, a uh, good pass rusher. Yeah, you know, I, I think he's he's probably he's probably overpaid for for what he does now, but he's still a really good pass rusher. They paid him as one of the best pass rushers in the NFL. He's not that anymore. He's a complimentary piece. But I tell you who I really like, and I and I've said this over and over. I think Dorrance Armstrong is one of the most underrated players in the NFL. He is a Great pass rusher, and if he ever reached the, the free agent market, I guarantee he would make it a whole lot of money. And if he wasn't on the Cowboys, he'd probably have a whole lot more sacks because he wouldn't have these other guys who are, who are also getting sacks. I mean, they got to split up these sacks because they're always back there. But they just have so many, all, and I, I think that's the key for this defense is they just have so much depth. Uh, in that defensive line, that they just really get after the quarterback. And, and speaking of not having any time, quarterbacks just don't have any time against this defense, and it makes it really, really hard. Uh, and they've been hard so far. So I guess we need to call them the New York Cowboys after victory over the Jets. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> hey, hey, Shireen, let's uh, get into Aggies in the NFL because we're up against it. Uh, where do you want to start? Well, we got four of them, and uh, I really thought Miles Garrett might get in the conversation, but uh, they they had a rough game last night. I thought he played pretty well, but we're going to go with these four. Um, And and i got to go four because I I can't leave anybody out. Josh Reynolds had an outstanding game, even though the Lions lost the Seahawks. He scored two touchdowns, five catches for 66 yards. Uh, Jamison Williams has been out, and he's really got his chance with the Lions, they've used him more, and he's been fantastic for them. And we always do he's a good receiver. He's shown that uh, with the Lions this year. Uh, number three, we're going to go with Christian Kirk. 11 catches, 110 yards. Didn't get many chances in the first game. They said after the first game, we got to get the ball to Christian Kirk more. I think he had one catch in the first game. we got to get it to him more. They did that. 110 yards for Christian uh, Mike Evans, I mean, what can you, mm-hmm. else can you say about Mike Evans? Six catches, 171 yards, a touchdown. He's really got a great chemistry right now with Baker Mayfield. It's almost like Johnny and Mike Evans, he's, he's trusting him even more than Tom Brady did. I got to get the ball to Mike Evans, and he's doing that, and good things are happening. I tell you what, if this continues for Mike Evans, not only is he, is he going to make Pro Bowl, maybe all pro, He's going to get a huge contract after this year. He becomes a free agent. Probably will finish his career elsewhere. Number one, Ryan Tannehill had a horrible outing in the first game. People were looking to bench him, career over, all of those things. He bounced back 20-24, 246 yards and a touchdown. He also ran for a 12-yard touchdown. Great bounce-back performance by Ryan. 
uh, and got the tank to the victory. That is Shereen Williams, Pro Football Talk. Shereen, thank you so much for making time. We will chat with you next week. Thank you, guys. Always good stuff there with Shereen there, and uh, the, the Mike Evans. Sounds like A&M is wide receiver you. If you want to make a lot of money in the NFL, it sounds like you should go to A&M as yeah. a receiver. Sounds like it. It's just a Josh Reynolds, Christian Kurt. And look at all the guys there. Mike oh. Evans. Pretty good. Pretty, we'll, pretty good. We'll, go, uh, we'll come back with some guests to spread. Right now we're talking Cap Rock, highly personalized emergency care. When you go to a Cap Rock hospital, their patients are going to benefit from a very unique one-on-one experience. They want you to feel so much better when you get in there because obviously you're going through a very tough time and that's their sole purpose is to make you uh, feel so much better. Should your stay require you to be there a little bit longer than expected, they're going to manage every element of your visit with a very low patient to doctor nurse ratio, which means their medical team gets to know you and your individual needs and their rooms are hotel quality. You're going to love staying there. You want to get out, right? You want to get home. But while you're there, you're going to feel like you're in a very nice place. That's what they do there at uh, Cap Rock. You can experience the difference there with their patient-centered revolution in care. They're 100% locally owned and operated, and they put the patient first in every decision that they make with two state-of-the-art facilities designed for patient healing and family family friendliness. You've got Caprock Hospital in Bryan and Caprock 24-hour emergency center in College Station. They both have zero wait time for emergency care, so you'll never have to sit in a crowded waiting room. It is Caprock Hospital in Bryan and Caprock 24-hour emergency center in College Station.
Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. Maroon never looks so good with Maroon U. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Luke Evangelist with Guess the Spread. Yeah, we're going to play a little fun game here. I'm going to give you a game, and uh, you can take turns guessing the spread. Give it your best informed guess. So we're going to start first with number four, Florida State at unranked Clemson. Florida State at Clemson. I'm going to go with Florida State by seven and a half. I'm going to say Florida State by five. So it's actually Florida State by two. And oh. according to my research, this is the first time in the college football playoff era that a top four team has gone on the road to an unranked opponent and wasn't favored by more than three points. Very interesting. Very interesting. I like this segment already. This is good info for yeah. Friday. Help us. What yeah, else? Yeah, that, uh, that Boston College game did not do them any favors. By the way, aren't you the moderator of the Gambling Geezers? Yes, I am. Yeah. And sometimes the uh, anta- antagonizer. And, and what antagonizer, are, whoa. And what do we call you, Bubby? I don't know. I don't know what any of my nicknames are mm-hmm. anymore. You're, you're, you're just my friend. Yeah. All right, continue, Luke. Next up, we've got uh, number five, USC, also going on the road to an unranked opponent, Arizona State. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say USC by 24. 27. It's actually 33. Oh, God, we suck at this game. I would have done well on prices right with that. <laughs> well, you would have beat me. Yeah, next we've got number 15, Ole Miss, at number 13, Alabama. The return of Jalen Milrow. Oh, so it is at Alabama. At Alabama, I'd say Bama by five and a half. Change it, seven and a half. I would say Alabama by three. David, you're spot on. Oh. It was seven. Okay. Seven, okay. Yeah, and then we're going to the Pac-12 for some ranked-on-ranked matchups. Number 19, Colorado, at number 10, Oregon. Uh, Oregon by 20 and a half. Uh, I'm going to say they're going to take o- Oregon by 10. David, you had to have looked at these notes oh, before because really? it's that 20 big. and a half. I've gotten yeah. one correct exactly. Yes. All right. Oregon's averaging 58 points per game this season. It's yeah. crazy. Next, we've got uh, number 22, UCLA, at number 11, Utah. But didn't Oregon struggle to beat Texas Tech? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Number but, 22, Utah, what? UCLA, at number 11, Utah. Ooh. Uh, Utah by two and a half. Yeah, Utah by three. It's five. Five. And finally, we've got number 24, Iowa, at number 7, Penn State. Uh, Penn State by 6.5. Penn State by 12. 14.5. OB wins that one. Yeah. That's huh. all we got. Iowa can't score. Huh. That was fun. Good job, Luke. Thank you. OB, you did pretty well. I mean, better than average, I would say. Did I? I'll pass. Yeah, you passed the test. Okay. Yeah, you did all right. Thank you, sir. When we come back on Texags Radio, we're going to talk, talk about some tight ends. Jake Johnson. Jake Johnson. Olin Buchanan. With Jamie McCoy. Next. I, I was a tight end. On Texags Radio.
A little Tribe Call Quest for you is Texags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. All right, let's talk to Jamie McCoy, who last week made me feel better about life uh, after he analyzed the A&M game, the uh, former A&M tight end. And I'm sure he's going to make me even feel much better after that performance. Jamie, good morning, buddy. What's going on, David? How you doing today? I'm good, man. So I, re- I remember our conversation yesterday. You were the first of many uh, former players that were like, dude, it's not as bad as you think. Like, these are some fixable issues. I don't know if we got those fixable issues answered in the ULM game because of the level of opponent, but I do feel better. How do you feel? I feel better. Um, anytime you go out there and uh, handle business, do what you're supposed to do against an inferior opponent, you got to feel good. Um, and I say that being that in years past, it's not like uh, we've always just gone out there and looked good against whoever it is that we're playing. So the fact that we came out there and defense didn't give up any big plays, no explosives, um, we kept the scoreboard low and we uh, did what we needed to, I, I feel good with that. And hopefully we can uh, keep it moving going going forward this weekend. Well, like you've got to, with the way the SEC is looking right now, like you've got to have, like they did exactly what they had to do, right? Like and, and there's some things that I didn't see that I want to see, but that's okay considering the way they lost the week prior and what's ahead. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I love I, I love that we're uh, mixing in three backs and everybody's getting a touch and everybody seems to be uh, capable with the ball in their hands. But I, I I still want us to have a big explosive run and kind of put our stamp on. Uh, hey, this is our identity as an offense. We're gonna be able to run it and move some furniture should we need to. And then defensively, I would just like to see our personality come out a little bit more. I think we're too vanilla um, and we we sit on our heels waiting. We let the offense dictate what's going to happen to us where I want us dictating and making them maneuver around what we're doing to them. So hopefully, I, I think it's going to have to come when we get a, a, up against stronger opponents. Um, something's got to shake. And I, I hope that I hope that we're able to dial up some pressure and make another quarterback uncomfortable. Talking to Jamie McCoy here on Tech Radio, presented by David Garner's Jewelers. All right, tight ends. Their, their, their role is growing in this offense this year. Each week has gone a little bit bigger and better. Uh, what would you think of Jake? What would you think of Max Wright? What would you think of the whole crew? Um, I thought they did well. Jake is, uh, Jake is really coming into his own, and he has one thing I wish I had, which is size. I mean, for, for Connor, you got to be you, – your, your eyes got to be lighting up seeing this big guy coming across the middle and kind of being your release valve. So I love what he's doing. Max coming in, blocking, making the catches that he makes and uh getting getting positive yards. That's that's all good. That's just bonus. Um I, I like where we're at at the tight end room. I, I love to see us get involved, like I said, in the red zone. Um, uh, with all the weapons that we have on the outside. I think we can sneakily get a guy up the middle seam or something like that. But these guys are coming into their own and hopefully we can just build on our blocking and build on uh, making plays for Connor. You talked about that middle seam. One guy that took advantage of that middle seam was Anaya Smith. Just uh, how good was it to see, I guess, the old Anias, if you will, because we knew he was there. It just He just yeah. hadn't had one of those performances yet. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And it, it reminds me a lot of my senior year. Uh, not that I had the chance to come out my junior year and go into the draft or whatnot, but it was like I had a good year my junior year, and I came into my senior year, and it was like, man, we got these young guys coming around. Everybody's making plays, but – where did my plays come in? So I started out kind of slow like he did. And then as you get into your your groove, uh, stuff starts to open up for you. And I think it was just good to see him get involved. I like to see Moose get a little bit more involved. We hadn't seen Noah do much since that first game. But just the fact that we've got capable weapons, um, I, you love to see it. Back to our old segment. But um, no, no, I think these guys are doing great. Um Hopefully, we, like I said, we just keep it moving. Well, you, capable weapons. One of those is Jade Walker, who was like, a lot of people didn't know who he was. And now I, they I'm do. I'm one of those. I'm one of those. I was like, who is not? I'm look, they gave a, we were at the game. They gave us a little roster sheet or whatever. I'm like, who is this cat? So it, we've got the weapons. We Offensively, I'm really not worried at all, um, especially coming up against our competition going forward. It's just defensively making teams fear us and getting the stops when we got to have them. 
Yeah, and, and this dude's got the size. He's got the ability to make plays. And, you know, we talked about wanting to see Anias make some plays. We got some plays from Jade Walker. We're still yeah. kind of waiting on Moose's emergence, but at least he was targeted a bunch this past week. Yes, absolutely. Um, I saw Moose starting out. He wasn't in there early, and then they finally got him involved. Um, the only thing I, I, I fear is somebody getting disgruntled in that wide receiver room and saying, or just being being a, a, a thorn in your side on the sideline. I, I, I just don't want to see any of our chemistry get knocked off that way, which is a very real thing. These guys, everybody has aspirations of getting to that next level, and the only way to do that is making plays. So I'm happy that our offense is looking smooth, but the only thing I fear is that somebody might say, hey, I want a piece of the pie, or I want to put my hand in, and I'm not getting the, the available opportunities because we've got all these other viable weapons. So... It's a balance of both. Connor's got to do a good job. Petrino's got to do a good job of just making sure that everybody's fed and everybody's happy, which I think we're doing good offensively. Jamie, I'm going to give you a long-winded way of getting to the question, but the running okay. game, first half and second half numbers weren't that different, but the, the benefit of the first half was a long Connor run, the 19-yard touchdown, right? So it kind of inflated those numbers as a group. That being said, in the second half, they ran the ball much more efficiently. Just your thoughts on that running game. Um, we've got a it's something that we're going to have to rely on at some point. So I love the fact that they're uh going back to it and putting so much emphasis on it. Um and run run game, run blocking is one of those things that you can't just talk about it on paper. You can't talk about it in meetings and walkthroughs. You got to go out there and actually displace a guy combo a guy and move up to the next level. So even though we were playing an inferior opponent in ULM, it's good to go out there and get as many reps and as much practice as you can because as we get to deeper into SEC play, the, the competition is only going to get better. Your, uh, your expectation level is going to have to rise. Everything is going to have to be rising and ascending as we move forward into this SEC play and uh, try to make a case for ourselves to get a good bowl game or who knows go undefeated and get into this playoff race. Who knows? Talking to uh, Jamie McCoy here on Texas Radio. All right, let's get back to the offensive line because I think they're getting better. Again, hard to tell against the opponent, right? Uh, they're better than they were last year, and they had two starters missing for most of that game in this past one. Just your thoughts on what you're seeing from them because Connor did not have a lot of time against Miami. Different level of opponent this past week. More time. Running lanes were a little bit better. Just your overall thoughts on how that line is gelling. Um, again, kind of like you said, it's kind of hard to say when we played two inferior opponents and then one better opponent and we didn't do as well against them. Um, but uh, all you can do is what what's what's presented in front of you. And this, this past weekend, those guys did a great job. I didn't see Connor in too much trouble. There were times, like we said, he had to scramble and whatnot, but that's football. You got to do that. Um I think that the offensive line, one, they need to emphasize the run because really as a as an offense in the whole, um, if we can be proficient in passing, in running, in all the phases of the game that offense takes, um, it's gonna it's gonna lighten the load everywhere. The better you can be in everything, the easier it's gonna be in everything. But if we start showing like in that Miami game that if you heat us up, we're going to have cracks. It only brings more of that. So you got to be able to fix those problems. So I know Auburn, the plan should be for them to kind of copycat Miami and put pressure on us. Our guys should be expecting that and be ready for whatever the call may be. If you can handle it and get out, get it out of the way early, hopefully teams in the future won't come back to that. So it's all ahead of us. If we can, the, the better we can be moving forward in these next games early it should help you down the road and uh, keep those guys from trying to bring that same stuff to you. Jamie, let's go back to the running backs and just kind of analyze the different skill sets that are there because you've got Amari who's got big play potential on him and, and seems to be a pretty steady guy. Uh, you've got Ruben who I think most of us feel he'll be the guy at some point, like the guy guy, right? And you got Le'Veon who I think the running game got extremely much, uh, extremely much better, much better when he came into the game there in the second quarter. Oh, yeah. These guys are all capable men. And the, the thing that I like about all of them is it's not like you got to bring one out 
for passing downs. I feel like all of them are capable pass catchers. Um, it's just going to be a matter of who puts who puts a stamp on it. I think Amari is getting most of the carries right now. All these guys are doing a great job. I, I really love the running back by committee. Um, it's not like when one comes in, hey, we should be expecting pass pressure or whatever the case. So oh, we're running now. Le'Veon's in. All these guys can do both things. So I think if they can just complement each other the way that they have been doing, the running game should be should be a breeze. If we can get our O line and the and the backs just on the same page, hopefully we uh we get this thing kind of sliding as we get get going. Talking to Jamie and McCoy here on Texax Radio. We spent some time on on offense. Let's turn our attention to defense. What is something that came out of that game that made you feel a certain kind of way? Anything that popped out? Um there was nothing too scary on their end for us. The thing that I love is just that we did what we were supposed to do. We didn't give up a lot of uh, explosive plays, like I said earlier, and we kept the score low. Uh, when you're playing these games, you don't want to give up cheap touchdowns. You don't want to give up cheap air yards and kind of hurt your average uh, of the season moving forward. So the thing that I liked about the defense is they just did what they were supposed to do. Nothing splashy, nothing crazy. Uh, which you don't always have to have that, but Ben don't break, and they didn't break this weekend. And I'm hoping moving forward we won't break either. Do you think Miami is, prepared them for SEC play? The fact that Miami was a more physical team, more athletic team, and probably better than we expected when we played them. I think so. I think we, I, I think we didn't think that they were as good as they were. And I think that when you got a team heating you up like that, kind of like I said earlier, it exposes you and it exposes what you did bad and what you weren't prepared for. And you got to know as a team, hey, whatever our flaws are, these are going to be amplified until we fix them. So I think more than anything, getting that loss got, got that kind of bad taste in your mouth. Hopefully moving forward, you're practicing harder, you're playing harder, you knowing what's at stake, especially with that one loss already. And then um, with the way that they were able to dominate us, they, they were pressuring us on offense and then um, coming after us on defense. I think you got to know SEC teams, if we're going to lose one, that's the formula. It's going to look a lot similar to that. So knowing that, we should be able to prepare and know, let's not put ourselves in that position. Jamie, it shouldn't matter, but it matters. But it shouldn't because A&M is in year six of Jimbo. They've recruited so well for so long. It shouldn't matter, but it does matter that you look around the SEC and they're struggling, man. There are teams that are struggling against inferior opponents like Bama did with South Florida, ends up winning by double digits, that uh, SEC, SEC teams are losing to ACC teams, right? Like it, it, to, to Pac-12 teams, like we're seeing it all over the place. So to me, I don't want to necessarily say it makes me feel better about Miami. What it does say is there's an opportunity there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. See, I wouldn't even go so far as SEC. I think it's just college football in general. I don't think they're – well, you you want to say Georgia. Uh, Georgia looks it on paper, but they came out there and were getting beat by South Carolina kind of handily that whole first half. It, it was a it was a good game, a better, a better game than I know that they were expecting. And then you go across town, you had Texas who was 10-10 with Wyoming going into the fourth quarter. So I think it's everybody. I think it's the whole landscape of college football. I think if you're undefeated, great. But if you got one loss like us, it's not the end of the world because some somewhere down this down the line, some of these teams are going to play a close game, whether it be a rivalry game or somebody just came, a road game, somebody just came ready to play. So if we can take care of what we need to take care of, which I think we will, that loss, I think, helps us be motivated to do that. I think we're going to be okay. Talking to Jamie McCoy. Jamie, what is something they have to do against Auburn? What, what is something they have to establish? Um, a dominance on defense. Whether it be if we're going to do the two-man and, and zone and, and play back on our heels, we've got to do that perfectly. We've got to um, – We've got to get some type of pass breakup, some type of turnover on defense and uh, make our presence known on defense. If we're able to do that, I think we win this game pretty handily. Let me ask you this. Let's say they have a dominant defensive performance, okay? How does that change uh -huh. the outlook of the season? Or does it change the outlook of the season because it's still Auburn, not one of the uh, 
supposed head honchos in the SEC? Um, I think it changes the outlook because Auburn's been a tough one for us these last couple of years. And I think just going into SEC play with a win, I think just gives everybody extra motivation. Um, if we can do that and go into a neutral site with Jerry World against Arkansas and come out of that 2-0, and I think we feel a lot better about our chances of Bama coming to our house uh, with their bad quarterback play. You know, they're they're dealing with their own issues themselves. So I think seeing that around the college landscape and knowing the position that we're in, I feel like everything's ahead of us. And these guys should be licking their chops and, hey, the SEC West is there to be won. Um, you know, nobody's looked great. Nobody's looked like their heads, heads over heels favorite. So if we can just build each week, get better, get a little better, get a little stronger in certain areas and uh, fix our weaknesses, I think we got a good chance. Jamie, what can't they do against Auburn? What, what, give me one or two things like, man, you can't do this. I know you're at home. I know you should win, but you can't do X or Z. We can't regress. We can't tackle poorly. We can't give up the big explosive play. And we've got to protect our quarterback. If we can do those things, if we can come out of there, hopefully injury-free, I think we're good. Don't you think, though, Hugh Freeze is, like, watching that Miami film and, like, dude, we're going to throw. We're going to throw on these guys. Like, we, we don't need to establish a ground game. What we need to do is throw. Yeah, he's got to be doing that. And like I said, anytime any coach sees what you did, what, what worked so well against you, you know they're going to go back to the well. So I know Jimbo has to know that. I know Durkin has to know that. These I, I think these guys are going to be prepared. I think Petrino has to know that. And we're coming back home. Um we gotta, we gotta, we gotta knock these guys off. I, I don't know what Jimbo and Hughes' relationship is, but I know he's got to know what type of pressure we're under. And uh, if we can go out there and look good, I think we we solidify ourselves as hey, we contenders in the SEC. Y'all, y'all, y'all need to fear us. Jamie, great stuff, bro. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. No problem at all, David. Thanks for having me. See you. Giggle. Giggum. Jamie McCoy on the hotline, as always, bringing some good insight and analysis on the program. When we come back on Texags Radio, the other Jamie, Jamie Morrison, is going to be joining us. We'll be chit-chatting with Jamie about uh, the Mississippi State game coming ahead, Arkansas coming as well. But before we do that, we're talking Charge Apparel. Have you guys checked out the website yet? Go to thechargeapparel.com. I always talk about how cool the clothes are. If you haven't been to the website, go and you can see what the clothes look like. And then I can vouch for the fit, right? And I can vouch for the dudes. They're, they're great. But I can vouch for the fit. So go to the website, take a look at some of the options they have there. I know they have the maroon polo now, which is awesome. I'm hoping to get one of those here real soon. But they are, they're a great company, guys. They are Aggie-owned, purpose-driven apparel brand. Two really cool dudes uh, that are Aggies. Tucker and you got Travis there, who met there in the, in the core, by the way. And after separating, they went to the military afterwards. And uh, you had Travis in the Air Force, Tucker in the Army. And after separating from the military, they formed the Charge Apparel as a way to continue to serve this country and this great community, too, by the way as I drop water everywhere, uh, through veteran nonprofits that they support. 12% of total sales, not just to profits, are donated to veteran nonprofit partners where they focus on mental health initiatives, which is a O to the 12th man, no doubt about it. And I've told you for a while about how good the clothes look and feel. They are just premier fabric. It is the best stuff out there that uh, the other top brands are using, right? Tailored fit through the chest and arms designed to make you look and feel your best. They are a Texas-based company that operates out of Austin, although they're currently behind enemy lines. One of their owners is from College Station, and both owners graduated from A&M back in 2014. The website, thechargeapparel.com. Find them on Instagram, The Charge Apparel, or on X, The Charge Brand.
All right, little Ryan Bingham in the background. This is Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Jamie Morrison in the studio. Hello, sir. Hello. Good to be back. I was telling you, I'm a big fan of this top, man. This man. is nice. Isn't it nice? I got a Jamie's hat. I'll give you this top. We'll, we'll just not, have a gear swap. Well, you know, it's funny. Like, I make those comments. I'm, it's not like I'm uh, wanting it back. I'm just, I'm, I'm very, uh, very fond of it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Let's, uh, let's talk about just the last, uh, I guess, week or so since the last time I talked to you, the, yeah. the, the Houston game. Um, there was also, um, afterwards, you, you lost to Houston, then you won. It was at Liberty? Liberty. Yep. And, and now you're setting up for SEC play. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we got off to a slow start against Houston and a really, really good uh, volleyball team. And uh, we talked afterwards just about the fact that we can't wait until the third set to get going. Um, and I thought we did a better job uh, in the Liberty match of getting going early on in that. And, and I think we got up 5-0 or something like that. And uh, that has to be how we play against great teams of uh, understanding that it's going to be a battle that we have to sit in it. And uh, I think we'll get there. Well, how do you get a team to have a quick start? Because I know you, you obviously want it, but it's, is it the way you practice? Is it the hours leading up to the game? What, what in, your, in your experience? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of all of that. Uh, for me, it's clearly identifying kind of who you it is that you want to be. Um, and then that lead up, that warm up, everything like that is trying to, I don't know, sharpen your sword to get to the point where you're that person individually and then you're that team uh, from the time you step on the floor. So um, new team trying to figure out exactly kind of what that identity is as we step out there and who it is that we want to be. And we've seen it in matches. It just needs to be consistent night in and night out. Listening to yesterday on the podium, you mentioned you knew the SEC was going to be good, but it's actually better than you thought. Is, is that because some teams are just playing at a, outrageous level is it maybe some of the lower level teams are actually pretty darn good is it both i think it's a little bit of everything um i, I think when you looked at the conference uh florida lost a couple players to the transfer portal but mary's done a really good job of getting that team and they're third in the country right now um lost a five set nail biter to wisconsin the other night the number one team in the nation um so i think that's a piece of it and then i think you have a bunch of really experienced teams right now with a bunch of fifth year seniors uh that are kind of talent laden and kind of top heavy with uh, a lot of experience so um, I think you see that uh, Arkansas is doing really really well mm -hmm. they're ranked 15th in the country Tennessee is doing the same thing ranked 16th in the mm -hmm. country I believe or something like that um, and then I think just uh, and not to my horn here but this there's been some really good addition of coaches uh, so I think Missouri hired a really really good volleyball coach that's going to do a really really good job there I think Ole Miss uh, has a really good volleyball coach that's going to do a good job there so I think you're going to see the level continue to rise but right now just as I look at it I'm like man we need to buckle up and get ready for a, a bump be ride because this is going to be a really really tough job you mentioned some veteran teams that you'll have to go against you all have a good mix but a lot of young players that are contributing young, yeah, yeah. Like whenever i look back at kind of what we did in our non-conference season and look forward to the, the sec like i think we're capable of doing some i don't know great things but then i look at the nucleus that we're building around too and i'm like man this is going to be here for a while and that's a really awesome thing but right now we're concerned on doing what we can within the sec this year uh and i think we can cause some damage well, let's talk about Margot in particular, how she has adjusted and playing at a high level. Yeah, uh, I think people always talk just uh, being a freshman setter is really, really difficult. And uh, I, think, I think we don't really do justice to what these student athletes have to do. Um, and I think they come in their freshman year and uh, they've kind of been used to this high school situation where one school isn't that difficult and all of a sudden they're thrown into a college atmosphere where uh, we look at the athletic side and you're kind of sharpening the sword as you go on. So you go from middle school to high school, you get some better athletes and you go from high school to college, you get some better athletes, but the same thing happens scholastically. And all of a sudden there's just shock to the system of like, oh, this is what college mm -hmm. is from a student standpoint. And then you throw on top of that, you're in the middle of a fall. Uh, and I think the difference in our sport uh, and different, the difference in football is we don't get to train them in the gym during the summer. Uh, where as Jimbo had his guys for uh, probably, I think, three months in that prepping for the fall, we get two weeks. Uh, legitimately, I think, 12 practices to get ready for kind of stepping out into the court and getting into the arena and playing. And uh, to do that as a freshman is really, really impressive. Um, and she did it as a true freshman in here where I, I call her other uh, freshman 1.5s because they got in here early last spring yeah. and kind of got their feet wet with school, with volleyball. Um, but what, she doing, what she's doing is pretty impressive. Do you remember your first test in college? My first what in college? Test. Uh, yeah, I, I remember I, I, I had a shock to the system. Like whenever I talk to our athletes yeah. about their GPA not being great freshman year, I give mine and I won't do it on the air in public. <laughs> um, but again, it's an adjustment. My sophomore year on, I had a 4.0. But uh, again, I know what that shock to the system is like. So yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I say it because I remember mine. I was a straight A student in high school, close to it, right? And I took my first test. I thought I knew how to study. Uh, 
It was Business 101, which I was told was the easiest business class, in school, and I got a C on it. Uh, Dr. Welch was the, I think he's still at A&M. And I was like, how did I, I studied for hours, wow. like, and I didn't know. So I, I'm just imagining what it's like to be a student athlete because you're studying game film. You're working on yep. so many different things. And oh, by the way, you're a college student. Yep. Yeah, whenever you look at it, I mean, we're, we're given 20 hours of practice. Like, that's a half-time job, and then you throw a full-time job of being a student on top of it. And just, there's a ton of respect on my end for what these student-athletes do. Get us ready for Mississippi State. What can you tell us? Yeah, just uh, watched a lot of video on them last night. I uh, have three good arms uh, on the team. Um, they run with some decent tempo, um, which is always a struggle in our sport to try to kind of cover for our middle blockers 15 feet in either direction and try to catch up with speed. Um and a good all-around volleyball team coached by a good friend of mine. So uh, really looking forward to the challenge of playing them. And then uh, the SEC is crazy. You turn around, and then all of a sudden you got Arkansas on Sunday, and then we turn around the next week, and we got Florida in the middle of the week. So uh, it's going to come hot here. It, it's so interesting because every sport, I feel like, in the SEC, it's the same conversation. Like, oh, if yeah. conference play comes, like, forget yeah. about it. Like, it's just a different animal. Like, and that's – all the sports yeah and i think that's that was the attraction for you right oh 100 and again like when i looked at it it was next year you get uh the other school in texas coming in and then you get oklahoma coming in and uh i was looking at that i'm like man the sec is gonna all of a sudden end up being one of the best conferences and like i said this year just kind of snuck up on me i'm like no it's one of the best conferences right now so uh but again that's why you do it you don't want to you don't want to be in a conference where you have i don't know 11 snoozers where practice is the highlight of your week basically and we want to get to that point where practice is the highlight of our week that we're good enough in our gym that uh, everything else feels like a snoozer. But um, it's nice that every single match is a challenge in a different way. Do you think your non-conference and only a couple of hiccups there prepared you for what's ahead? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and we talked a little bit. There was some purpose behind kind of the way we did it of kind of getting uncomfortable as we went. The two teams we played at the end that we lost to, I think we learned from that. Um, so I, I hope. And uh, the other thing, too, is just we set it up for uh, the way our sport works is the, the tournament is selected heavily on RPI at the end of the year. Um, and there's a simulation that's run out there. And right now we're a simulator RPI 19 which means we're actually close to being seated in the tournament, uh, and that's with 10 losses. So uh, so I, I like where it set us up for the end of the year. Um, I think we're prepared as a volleyball team, especially kind of with those two late ones and what we learned from losing, uh, to go do some damage in the SEC. Last thing for you, I'm looking at some of these numbers. You all are so well-rounded, tw top 25 in blocks per set, hitting percentage, opponent hitting percentage doing the things that you probably have a checklist of things you want to be good at, yeah. and that there you are. Yeah, no, we have some key performance indicators, and uh, they kind of go in there, and those are pretty much them, probably a little bit more advanced than that. But 100% uh, we're where we need to be statistically. Um, the one thing we talk about is just we need to be able to grind it out within a rally and do those things over and over again when things get difficult. Well, we're looking forward to a quick start. And uh, hopefully a couple wins here this uh, over the next week. Yeah, Wednesday. We're at home, 7 o'clock. So uh, 12th man, just, uh, I, I'll keep saying it, but thank you for showing up, and uh, we hope to see you there. Fill it up, guys. Fill it up. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Appreciate you. Right now, call to number one. We're going to give you a free car wash from Aggie Land Express Car Wash in South College Station off of William D. Fitch in Greens Prairie. They're Aggie owned and operated with the friendliest staff and a personal touch. They offer a monthly membership. We'll give the first caller a free car wash right now from Aggie Land Express in South College Station. 979-693. 1150.
KBTX3. Sorry. Texas Radio oh. presents. Excuse me? Weird. <laughs> Why? I liked it. No, See? you didn't. She, she laughed. No, she, KBTX3. A little giggle. <laughs> Do radio um, voiceovers? I, I, if they paid me, Could sure. No, but have you ever done them? Yeah, of course. Thanks for listening to the zone. Appreciate it. No, really. Thanks. Well, I well, only like, listen to our segment. Like commercial <laughs> voiceovers. Yeah, I do. Yeah. That's, those are called commercials. Oh, you do the um, the one about sponsored by the mom, your mom, Pardon? the joints, heritage films. No, my mom. What? Yeah, you're like whose mom? Your mom. You're like talking about some kind of health service. I am. I heard it one time. Huh. Anyway, hi friends. Good morning. Nicole morning. Morgan. It's our our KBTX three and. Uh, the big three observations. Everybody's favorite segment's coming up in a little bit. What's going on, ladies? What's going on with you? Nothing. You've got nothing to say to me. You're not, just mad. Uh, no, I, Morgan. It's early. Yeah, Morgan has had coffee. I have not. I've had three so. cups of coffee already. I've got 12 interns that are doing nothing. You want some coffee? No, I'm not going to have interns give me coffee. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You don't have 12 interns. I have one. I'm just <laughs> I have kidding. have one. <laughs> anyway. You're uh, very busy. Let's, let's talk about what we saw this past week because... I feel like since we got to town, we don't get a lot of really good performances, right? We, mm. got, we came right around the same time. Mm -hmm. When there's a good performance, we got to talk about it. And inferior opponent or not, they looked really good. Uh, Nicole, you start us off. Yeah, I think that there was a lot of concern coming off the Miami game, seeing how this team would bounce back after a loss mm -hmm. because you never know. It's the, the string of losses last year, I think, has really – kind of lives in people you know it's kind of on the back burner people are a little concerned about it um i'm kind of in the camp of you know i'm glad i'm glad that they won i'm glad that they handled and took care of business but what really did ulm show us mm. um nothing yeah i mean okay I, thank you i just nothing nothing no i agree i i'm glad they got that bounce back win they needed it they responded well after miami but again they were playing ulm so glad they got the win heading into SEC, but... Let me throw this at you guys, oh. because I agree like, with you. Where's I, the football? I don't know. Somebody broke it. Oh, it's over there. Uh, broke it? I don't know. I just, you I, break a football. Deflate. Deflate. No Tom Brady. <laughs> anyway, so his, this is, I, I think when we cover a team or a fan of a team, we see things like this, right? Mm -hmm. Narrow vision for those listening on radio, right? You just see it one way. Tunnel vision, I should say. But look at all these teams in the SEC. Every, like the Alabama South Florida game, mm -hmm. that is brutal, gross, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, A and M lost to a pretty good Miami team. We'll see how good they end but up. But they being. could be putting up like fourteen points against the ULM. How did we feel last year? Even in wins, and a loss to Appalachian State, mm -hmm. by the way. Even in the game against Sam Houston, you're like this. This offense is moving at us yeah. like they're underwater. They're slow. So I think, mm -hmm. regardless, and the defense has got a long way to go for me to feel comfortable. It looks better. Don't you agree? The whole presentation, everything about it looks better. I'm wrong, right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's just the persona that Connor, Connor Wigman has mm -hmm. when you have the quarterback or the star player, any sport that you have, pitcher, point guard, yeah. post, you, you have the guy that is like, okay, we have our quarterback. We're in a good position. Last year, you know, they went through. Ah, football. Here, <laughs> is that supposed to be there? It is supposed to be there. Um, I'm a, I make things happen. Look at you. <laughs> I make change now, happen. Now Nick is going to be upset that we made him do it in the middle of the segment. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick. That's all right. Shout Nick. out Nick Savage. Um, brought us the football. Um, but I think with having Connor, there's just like some sense of uh, confidence and just was like relaxing. Like you can just, mm -hmm. he's, he can take care of business. You're not worried about who has the starting position. Are you going to go through th three quarterbacks? Obviously, Max. Um, has gotten in um, against New Mexico and you all in the third quarter and fourth quarter. But I think that there's just a, a sense of um, confidence with this offense. No doubt. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Cause Please do. Perfect. I, I don't feel completely at ease yet after the Miami game because, again, ULM is not as talented as Miami was. And Miami's sure. a good team. And I think Auburn will present some more challenges, but still not as much challenges as they might see against in Arkansas or other SEC West teams like in LSU. So I still think we have to wait and see. Although they do look a lot better than last year, and I do feel more comfortable, especially with Connor and Bobby Petrino and the talent that they have out wide. I feel more comfortable. They failed their first real test. Yes. And, that, and, and you're not going to – I don't think you will feel better – until maybe after the Bama game. And I don't even know how much better that will make you feel. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Bama could end up losing this weekend to Ole Miss, and yeah. they'll have two losses. That's a very possible situation. And then you have Tennessee after that, who just got beat by Florida, and then you go into the bye, and it's like, okay, where's like the real test here? Mm-hmm. Well, the whole season. Yeah. But that's, I guess that's why I look at it as a And M has a, every team in the SEC West has a real opportunity here, right? And I don't think they have to be. Uh, I'd love to see a top ten defense. I don't think they have to be a top ten defense for this team to win a lot of games in the SEC. Mm-hmm. I think they just need to be a, a tackling defense, right? A little bit of pressure on the quarterback, and then it, it changes just those two things right there. Uh, and, you know, I'll, there's, there's a lot of go-tos. Strong offensive line, strong defensive line, sure. But make some tackles in open space. Mm-hmm. You tackle in open space against Miami, you win that game. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I remember going into Miami. I was like, oh, I'm not worried about the secondary at all. I was like, you need to be worried about the secondary in yeah. this game. But um, I think it helps a lot just seeing the offense more secure, the O-line healthy, and Connor back there. It gives us a little more at ease when the offense is doing well. But this, I think the secondary will get its act together. Let's, t- let's play right now sports analyst. Can we? Can we do that? I can try my best. Right. Uh. <laughs> Where is Connor in the hierarchy of SEC quarterbacks, Morgan? Oh, I, he's up there. He's top three for me mm-hmm. at the moment. I think Gotta you have, be. yeah, you have KJ Jefferson up there. Um, but he's up there. He's doing great. And I it, like you mentioned like a point guard. To me, that's how I always relate to my quarterback. I'm like, do I trust the ball in his hands? Is he going to turn it over? And I don't know. I think we can trust him for now. He hasn't proven otherwise. I think he has a lot of football to be played because how many games has he played in? He's still young. He doesn't have a mm-hmm. lot of experience. But for the lack of experience, I think he's really proving himself and stepping into his own. Where is he in your hierarchy? Well, I'm going to go off of numbers. So in the, uh, he's fourth in passing in the SEC, mm-hmm. which is really interesting because the, the top is um, Vanderbilt. Vandy's, yeah, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> is Vanderbilt over 1,000, followed by Jane Daniels. And They're then, playing catch-up a lot. Eight, yeah. And then um, I know I was like, Vanderbilt, um, then Jaden Daniels, and then um, Spencer Rattler. So, you know, he's in good company with um, veteran players up there, being the sophomore that Connor is. And so um, I think we're, it's just really exciting to see him grow each week and see how each challenge presents itself. He's had, you know, 230 yards, 330, 330. So he's close to 1,000, three weeks, uh, three games in. So, yeah. I mean, I guess that's not very hard as a quarterback. It's, to get to a thousand three games in, well, maybe I thought it was interesting. Spencer, you have he, he has games. a chance to make it four games in a row. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a different little spin on the numbers that you just heard there because QBR he's number two, two in the country nation. behind Michael Penix, right? Mm-hmm. And then our he's really good, who's yeah, r- really <laughs> really good, really right? Good. And then the fact that he's in the top two, all right. Mm-hmm. Our stats team, I, I call it stats team. We got a bunch of interns that put some stats together for us. <laughs> all twelve, all one. <laughs> all, actually, I have, I think, five. Okay. okay. But at the moment, one. But that being said, actually, two back there. You look at the last few national championship winners, QBRs, they're all in the top, like, six. Uh, Stetson Bennett was six last year. He was mm-hmm. three the year before. Mac Jones was number one. Joe Burrow was number one. So the fact that you have a quarterback that is playing at that level, mm-hmm. and by the way, they did take on a very good defense in Miami, at that level tells you a little bit about the potential for this team because it does start at, at QB1, doesn't it? It mm-hmm. does. It does for me. He sees the field really well. I feel like he can step up into the pocket or he can you – know, I know people were talking about the, the sidearm yeah. passes a lot. Um, and It's obviously kind of maybe the baseball in him, the shortstop in him, um, the quarterback in him. He sees it really well. He can uh, – I know he jokes about being like Lamar – Yep. when he runs <laughs> so anytime he runs for more than 10 yards I think of the Lamar quote but I'm um, just going back and watching the game you can see him um the pressure that ULM did bring um but he also had a ton of time in the pocket so he, and then he has a ton of receivers and um threats in the with the wide receiver so you know it's it just seems like the perfect, and you never know what you're going to get each game because this player will have 100 yards this player will have 100 yards this player will have 100 yards so um it's, I'm just really excited, and it's interesting to see how you know each game will play out. All right, Morgan, who caught your eye offensively, and you can't say Connor? Okay, I wasn't going to say I know. Connor. I just want to make sure we just spent 20 minutes on him, so I wanted to make sure um, we, we get spread the I, love. I, I, I'm going to say, I don't, who are you, I don't want to take who you're going to say. I was going to say Anias. Okay. Because they got him the ball, he didn't oh, find. Oh, her eyes. You were no. going to say Anias? Okay. You no, can say, I have. You can say Jaday. 
I, actually, I think the wide receiver room proved its depth when you don't have Evan Stewart out there and you don't have Noah Thomas mm -hmm. out there, but you still have the productivity out wide that they did. It's really impressive because it's really the wide receiver group is showing their depth and Anias is just selfless. Yeah. Put yeah. up 127, what's seven or six? Yeah, and six receptions. Like he's just that guy. And I think it's great to have that leadership out there and having somebody that is so selfless and doesn't need to get the, in the end zone to have a good game and catch my eye. There you go. <laughs> now he's in the top eight of receipt, or he is eighth. But he's not number one, so. Well, not yet. He says he doesn't care until he's number one. Right. So I wrote like four players down, but all um, on the wide receiver. But I'll go with Jade Walker. I feel like he had kind of a coming out game. I remember in the first game, I should have just noticed. It's just the things you notice when you're finally on the field watching. I didn't know Noah Thomas changed his number. And then so, because he was nine. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, that's not Noah Maybe Thomas. He changed his number. I think he just changed it this offseason yeah, off from oh, yeah. nine to three. And then people. I you meant like after game one. I'm no, like, no, no, no. no. <laughs> he, yeah, I, the things you notice on the first week, game of the week, but or first game of the year, but um, just realizing Jade Walker having that coming out game. And I really think that propels confidence going into the next game. Obviously, uh, Auburn is different than ULM, but knowing that, okay, I've been able to get, I've already had. I've reached the end zone. I've had over 100 yards. Um, making that connection with Connor is just He's who, who stood out to me, especially being um, a newcomer on the team. All right, keep it with you defensively. <sighs> okay, this is stressful because um, the defense. I don't. How, how do you say it? has not been very up to par, up to standard. One game they weren't up One to game. par. Okay, okay, okay. One They're real very, game. Okay. The only real. And game. it's only like half the defense. Yeah. So. Um, the young secondary. So I would go, I think the linebackers are really holding it down. So yeah. I would go with Edron Cooper. He was our player to watch um, going into last game. <laughs> fun fact, or it's not very fun, but our player to watch last week was um, Evan Stewart. Well, watch we did him watch him on the sidelines. Yes, we exactly. Did, so I'm him. like, I'm a little nervous on who to pick for the Auburn game. So um, hopefully I'm not like cursing any of these players, but Edron Cooper. Edge Cooper. All right, Morgan. Um, Shamar Turner. Yeah. They spoke so yeah. highly of him yesterday. You were at the press conference. I, I actually asked the question. Thank Did you. Did you? Uh, that was me. Thanks for paying oh attention. Goodness. What was your question? I don't remember. Something I thought about you asked Shamar about Turner. the linebackers. And I followed up. And I actually said the word follow up. Let me ask you about Shamar Turner, three sacks, three gains. And then yeah. Jimbo went but on. He's like, I'm not surprised. Because yeah. he loves football. He's a big football guy. He loves to work out. He yeah. loves to practice. He loves to play games. He, he loves every everything. every practice like a national championship. That's my kind of player right yeah, there. Yeah, I know. So he's obviously for me. Yeah. And obviously, Torian York, too, just being a freshman and making a big impact out there, too. He has made an impact. All right, let's do this. We'll hit a break. We're going to come back with our KBTX3. Ooh. And then I'm going to ask you what questions have to be answered against Auburn. All right, you ladies ready for that? I guess. Do I have a choice? Yeah, I mean, you could leave. That see would be ya. awkward. We'll see what happens after the break. Right now, since you've never heard one of my spots, uh, we're talking Heritage Films. That's Chance McLean's company. They make documentary films. Like even Morgan and Nicole could have a documentary made about them or their families. They're awesome that Chance does. They make them about your family, your family business, your family ranch, your dad, your uncle, maybe even your boss. They tell the story. It's like a Netflix documentary done for just normal people. That's what Chance does. Uh, he's a very creative guy. He started a radio station, hired me back in the day. Uh, he's done Broadway musicals. He's done movies. And now he's doing Heritage Films and these two-hour documentaries. So they're awesome, right? But beyond that, he also has the Year Flicks, which is phenomenal. 20-minute videos, a Q&A thing for kids. We did one with my daughter, Annalise, and it's like 20 minutes of just rapid-fire questions. They'll let these kids talk, and it's like a benchmark video. You get to know them from a different perspective. The website, yourheritagefilm.com, yourheritagefilm.com, 
Where are we with Fast Car and Luke Combs? Do we like it or oh, is it played out? It. Yes. That's my. No, I love it. I'll listen to it every day. Okay. Fun fact: the Tracy Chapman version is my alarm. Why is that? Was that just on? It's, it's playing right now. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we can't. Oh yeah, random. So my kids heard the Tracy Chapman version and almost vomited on me. I'm like, that. This is not the real song, Dad. I'm like, <gasps> oh, no, that's the original, that's bro. That's so disgraceful. Yeah. But They're both good. I like Luke's. Sex Acts Radio presented I by like David Gordon. I like the live version. Yes. The live. He did it on a I concert. I love live versions of songs, though. I haven't heard the live version. Oh, it's well, something to do. Something to do on, on homework. the break. Homework, homework for, for next KBTH Roundtable. Three. <laughs> big three. <laughs> burr, big burr. Three songs that we, we should have some week. production value for this. The KBTX Big Three Observations. But you don't even have the three on here. Who's going first? I wrote, I wrote them down, so... You got do three. You want me to go, or do you want to go? You can go first, and um, then I'll take away the things Connor that. Connor was fantastic again. Okay. That's haven't one mentioned of them. that yet. Haven't mentioned. If it you at mention all. it every week of the season, that's a good thing. It is right. So right. I'm going to keep mentioning it. Connor, Connor, he's Connor. Not. Um, I think I already mentioned this earlier, but the wide receiver depth is real. We saw that with Jaday Walker, um, and then Anaya Smith. He was my other observation. You gotta give me something. You can't no, just say his gotta, name. You gotta back it up I with the said, why. I already said earlier, kind of why. Mm -hmm. um, just selfless, a leader, 127 yards, leading the wide receiver group in yardage. So yeah. And we had been asking for him. We've been have, asking for him to get the ball. I still want to see Moose Muhammad get the ball though. Yeah, I agree. Moose through two games had 27 yards. That was mind-boggling to me. Yeah, it's um, part of it. I think is. You're deep, <laughs> you yeah, know, like, don't need it, but and your tight ends are getting becoming a bigger part of the offense. The running backs are catching balls out of the backfield. That's another observation. It's also giving what the defense. So we changing channels now. We're on channel four. Just no, kidding. just kidding. But Amari Daniels. There too. is no channel four. Not here. There's not. There is, but there's not. We're not news four. We're news three. News four is that is that Ron Bergen? He's a different channel. Do you guys remember? I can't remember. Never. Do you know Anchor Robert? Man? Yeah. I've only seen it once. Oh my God, it's so good. How have you only seen it once? You work in the business. You should watch it daily. I actually watched it on a date. But that's a whole nother story. Like on, on like on Netflix or like at a theater? You're like nine when that came out. No, like recent. Okay. Like within the past five years. Oh, okay. He was like, you've never seen that? We're going to watch it. So, so we watched it. Part two? Not so good. No. Never. I haven't got, there wasn't a second date. Is so. that the one where he's in the lighthouse? I don't remember. I don't remember like my name. Nicole, what else? David Nunez. Oh, okay. okay, my three takeaways. Um, special teams, I think, is the unsung hero. Punter from down under. <laughs> Nick Constantino punt. That's what I had next. Is that, is that your line? I, haven't, I don't think I've heard that one. Have you heard punter from down under? I don't know. Maybe. I don't think There's so. There's like 61 FBS teams that have an Australian punter on their roster. Uh, stats. She's, stats. She's a special teams girl. Can you join our stats girl. crew? We need, need to. Never mind. Go ahead. How well will you pay me? Oh, no, it's not paid. <laughs> Uh, Randy Bond having a new career long, 51 yards. And the returners, I feel like, have had, I've been filing when I file the games, they've had a lot of nice returns, but they haven't, you know, really clicked yet on that one for like the um, the big game. The, yes. So like, it's hard because it's like, do I want to file this like 20, 30, 40 yard return? But like, he then, doesn't take it to the house, no. Exactly. And then, um, I thought it was, they scored on the first seven drives. Um, obviously, it was, would have liked a touchdown on the first drive. I know it was fourth and two or three, and Jimbo elected for a field goal. I was like, just go for it. Like, you need to make a statement. But, I mean, they won by 44 points. And then I also have Anaya Smith. Nice seeing him getting more touches and breaking um, 100 and breaking into the top top 10. So. Ladies, great job. Thank you very much. That's Thank it. You. That's it. Are that was 30 done? minutes. Fast. That was, that was not 30, 30 minutes. 20 minutes. So, no, it wasn't. Yeah, we started it's, at 935. It's, it's 956. 9 there was a two-minute break, so Wait, sorry. Time flies when you're having fun. Thank you. See? Especially with this host. Time for the voiceover. Coming up next on Texas Radio, <laughs> Jordan Pugh, former player, going to break it all down. Matt and more. Sorry, I can't. It hurts my throat. Talk to you guys in a bit.
When Keeping It Real Goes Right, Texags Radio, presented by David Gardner Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's talk to Jordan Pugh, who always keeps it real here on the program with his facts and analysis. Jordan, good morning, buddy. What's going on, man? How you doing? I'm good. You know what I like? It's been like several weeks in a row that you've been in a good mood, right? There were a couple times yeah. last season you weren't in a good mood, and I, I think you see the potential in this team, man. Is that a fair way of starting it off? Yes, yes, I would say that, man. You know, uh, it, it's funny how things can change in a year, but you just see the progression, you see the maturation. So, you know, I think the potential is there. Uh, you know, that's one of the the words I hate in the English language is potential. I hate that word because that just means you haven't tapped in, you haven't done anything with it yet. But I think that, you know, uh, just the trajectory that we're on, I think that there's something special, man. I think they're building each week. So I'm excited, man. It, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot of things that are different from last year. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, with this team. So it, it's exciting to watch, and it's something to build on. Yeah, we're talking to Jordan Pugh. Jordan, uh, we're going to flip it around a little bit this week. I want you to come out with your facts, and then I'll follow up with some questions yep. afterwards. I know you've got some five right, facts so to get us. Let's do it. So first couple of things, we'll start offensively. I think the majority of things that I, that I noticed was offensively with our play okay so I think I'm starting to understand what we want to be on offense I think we want to be as well balanced as possible okay so the more and more I watch you look at the three games that we've played you look at how we spread the wealth uh, in our past game all right so you see different receivers that uh, that that get majority of the touches throughout each week so you know it's been Evan Stewart uh, heavy you saw Anaya, Anaya's finally uh, get involved, you know, over 100 plus receiving yards with him. Uh, you saw, I think, Jade Walker, man, make, make his presence known. Uh, it's not your typical cast uh, characters that you saw. You saw Jake Johnson get a little bit more involved. The more and more that I watch the offense, I see the, the best way I can put it is a receiver by committee, all right? I think you're seeing more of a well balanced attack. Understanding that we have multiple weapons on the outside and getting them involved in a game plan makes it harder to plan. Uh, for opposing defenses, right? Uh, in the past, you look at last year's team, you know, we had Anias. Uh, he went down early. You know, Evan came on late, but Moose was mainly the guy, right? Moose stepped in, uh, made a lot of plays for us, but he was also easy to keep. You look at what we're doing on the outside, I think we're spreading that ball around. Uh, we're, we're, we're creating a lot of one-on-one matchups because we're not allowing defenses to key on one, uh, one personnel grouping or one person in and of itself. So that's something that's exciting to see. I think Connor took another uh, step forward. You saw him take command of the offense again. The thing that I'm starting to like is I'm starting to like his efficiency. He's getting better and better every week. He's making more and more uh, uh, confident plays, but he's he's anticipating um, scenes. He's anticipating routes a lot better. So I like that. Um, I like how he has a better knowledge of using his feet. I think the way that he uses his feet is, is getting better each week, and I think he's getting more and more comfortable within the offense. Right. Uh, so we also talked about that, but we also talked about getting Anias in the game. You saw his presence. You saw uh, his presence felt within the game as well. I think, you know, getting him uh, the, the touches that he got on the receiving end, you saw him move into the backfield a lot more. You saw the versatility that he possesses on the offensive side. So I think now you're starting to see Petrino get a little bit in his in his bag a little bit. Right. You are starting to see him uh, uh, in multiple formations, multiple uh, scheme sets with our players, I think you're starting to see him uh, see what you hired him for, okay? I think he's slowly been progressing or pulling it out. But as we get into SEC play, I think you'll see a lot more of it, right? Um, if you ask me the first two weeks, I've been saying that I think we need a bell cow running back. Now, watching the game, thinking about it, I'm slowly starting to be convinced on the three-back system. Slowly. I'm not there yet, <laughs> but I'm slowly starting to be convinced I just think you have three dynamic guys. And then I think this ULM game showed me that they all have three different traits. Okay. You know, you got your, you got your, your pounder, you got your explosive guy in Owens. You kind of have a dual threat in Daniels. I just think, man, there, there's something there. I still think you need a guy. I think you need a lead guy, but I I'm, I'm starting to understand what he's doing as far as, you know, uh, getting guys to touch moving that ball around, keeping the defense guessing. Okay, so I think that he's doing a good job of that. And I'm interested to see what this Auburn game looks like um, going into SEC play, man. I'm, I'm really interested to see what that offensive scheme is going to be based off what I've seen the past three weeks. Then the, the last thing that I'll say is this. We still got to – we still need work at the DB position. There's too many times we're getting beat one-on-one. 
there's too many times that guys are running wide open. We're vacating zones still. We still haven't fixed that problem. We are too athletic on the back end to be looking at suspect. That's a problem. And I think as you get an SEC play, as you go against more explosive uh, players, more explosive offenses, I think there's going to be some issues if we don't address that right now. I liked what we did on the defensive line. We didn't run as many games as stunts. We went a lot more three-man front. I expected that against ULM, practice that, because there's going to be times and moments within the rest of the season you're going to need that. You're going to need more DBs on the field. Uh, but I liked how they let them rush more, create more havoc. Uh, uh, not as many, as many, as not as much movement up front. So overall, I thought it was good. I thought we did what we were supposed to do. But I was really impressed with what I saw on offense. Talking to Jordan Pugh here on Texas Radio. All right, Jordan. So Auburn's scheming up right now. Hugh Freeze is looking at his pot and he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. I mean, are we going to see just a, an aerial attack until A and M can prove that they can stop it? I think so. That's what I would do if I was Hugh Freeze. You know, the, the one thing that he he's known for is his offense. He's known for his multiple schemes, and he's he's known for for misdirection. I think we have got to be able to solidify our back end, our our front seven. I think is, is really our D-line, like I've said before, I think we got one of the best groups, more talented groups in the country. They're going to get their pressure. I, I think I think I heard something about Hugh Freeze even saying that, saying, look, they're loaded <laughs> on that on their front. But I think a lot of the, the problem that we're going to have is a lot of the misdirections, getting our guys up front to move lateral, which will open up uh, seams downfield. If we don't fix that problem, and I think he's going to exploit that, and a lot of teams are going to exploit that. So I, you know, I don't, I don't know necessarily what you do. I don't know if we live in that three-man front with more uh, of DB package on the field. I don't know if we go more heavy set because I think Auburn has their deficiencies on offense in and of itself. But until we get that back end fixed or, or, or we patch it up as much as we can, I think there's going to be a lot of big plays that we give up and we're going to have to be able to hold steady when we get into that red zone situation. I want to follow that up because let's just say the, the issues on the back end don't necessarily get fixed, at least to the level that we'd like to see. The Miami yep. game alone, if you just make a tackles, right? Like, yes. if you just tackle, like, uh, do they win that game if they just make tackles? And can it be as simple as that based on the personnel that you have to win a lot of games in the SEC? I know we want it perfect. You, you give yourself a better chance to win games, especially when you make tackles. All right, so let's, let's look at the, the game that everybody's talking about, the Colorado-Colorado State game. Here's what Colorado State did. They knew that they had great athletes on the outside. They knew that they had to tackle well whenever they were in space. That's the one thing Colorado State did is they emphasized the tackling in space, right? So it, it forced them to be methodical. It forced Colorado to be methodical and move down the field, and it gave them problems. I think a lot of the times that, that – so it's, it's twofold with our defensive backs. One, there's a lot of vacated zones, a lot of wide open space within our seams. Um, there's a lot of times we've gotten beat one-on-one. -on -one. But if we just make the initial tackle, you kill a lot of that yak yardage, right? You force the offense to dial up more plays, drive the ball down the field. I think if we eliminate that, if we can just do that one simple thing, you'll see a change within the defense. I also think you'll see a lot more pressures out of us too. Whenever you have a secondary that, that's struggling a little bit like that, you got to find a way to create pressure to get that ball out fast. Uh, so I think you'll see a lot more uh, pressures out of by Durkin, but we got to be able to fix that tackling issue. Jordan, why are you optimistic when it comes to putting pressure on a quarterback, something we haven't seen consistently in, in a season and some change? You say, say that again, they cut out. Why, why are you optimistic about being able to put some pressure? Because we really haven't seen very much of it. Well, I'm optimistic because of the, the front that we have, the, the D-line that we have. I just think whenever you have a defensive line, that opens up a lot of things that you can do on defense, Okay. I think, you know, like I've said before in the past, I think a lot of the stuff that we've done running a lot of the games and the stunts have has crippled us a little bit with, with how dynamic we can be on the defensive line. We have the dudes up front to just let them go. Get up field, create chaos, do what you got to do. I think you'll see a lot more of that. That in and of itself will create a lot more pressure. Then if you add an extra man to the box, or add an extra guy who's unblocked, I think that'll open up a lot more. That'll allow our DBs to be more aggressive. That allows the ball to get out quick. It also makes the offense predictable when you can create the pressure like that. So the reason why I'm optimistic more so than ever is the defensive line that we have that I know can create a lot of pressure, a lot of havoc. Talking to Jordan Pugh here on Texas Radio. So what has to happen? Give me a thing on offense. Give me a thing on defense against Auburn. Ooh. Uh, we have to establish... I don't want to put this. We have to establish a runner, a, a running back to get over 80 yards. 
we need one guy. <laughs> I want to say a hundred, but we need we need one guy to establish eighty yard uh, running game because that opens up the offense. I think also offensively, you got to allow Connor to be Connor. I think we need more downfield throws. I think he's getting more comfortable. I think he's understanding the play action game that we have. We need more explosive plays offensively. Defensively, the one thing that I think we need, and it's going back to the D line, is we need. Yes, more pressure, but I think we need to get our hands on the quarterback more, meaning more sacks. I think if we create more sacks, we create more uh, long distance downs uh, for Auburn, which allows more predictability uh, when it comes to the offensive side of the ball and allows us to play more aggressive on defense. I think we need to see those things, man, in order to be effective this weekend. Jordan, how surprised are you on what's happening around the SEC? The struggles, the closer games than expected. I mean, you could point at almost any team, and there is a similar narrative to what's happening at A&M. Yep. Well, I think it's just be, the one thing that is that separates the, the SEC is the, the line play, O and D line play. But the main uh, thing that I see is the quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. When you have a set of quarterbacks, man, that just leave the SEC, guys are playing all through the NFL, man, it's going to be – you're going to have some down times, some down seasons. That a lot of that has shifted to the Pac-12 where you've seen a lot of the best quarterbacks, but you used to seeing that in the SEC. I just think it's one of those years where – um, a lot of the quarterbacks have been so elite that it makes everybody around them <laughs> play better, right, when you have that guy. Uh, I think that's what you're seeing in the SEC, man. Everything is cyclical. Everything goes in cycles. I just think this is one of those years where it's wide open. It's one of those years where everybody is on the same playing field in the SEC right now. And there hasn't been one, one team that has pulled itself to the elite level yet. I think that's coming. You're only three games in. I think that's coming. But right now, I think the, the lack of elite quarterback play across the conference is what you're seeing uh, the difference be this season. We're talking to Jordan Pugh here on Texags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. You mentioned quarterback play, and we've talked to Connor. So when you look at the SEC, I mean, the list of people playing at a higher level than Connor isn't long or at all, right? Like, especially in the yep. SEC. Where, where do you put them there in the SEC pecking order right now? To me, I think he's the top guy. I, I dare somebody to name somebody that's better than Connor. You had Jay Daniels who had one week, one week where he looked good against Mississippi State, but I am not a believer in LSU because I'm not a believer in Jay Daniels. I think he's too inconsistent. I think he'll give you one great game. He'll give you one lackluster game. Everybody else across the SEC, can you really name a starting quarterback other than Spencer Rattler just because he's been there 12 years? <laughs> you see what yeah. I'm saying? It's all inconsistent play. The one person who's been consistent throughout the SEC is Connor. Connor's been consistent. Connor has been very efficient. Uh, I was looking somewhere. I think he has one of the best QBRs. In Number the two in the country. Uh, yeah, boom. There it is. One of the best QBRs. And nobody's talking about him. I just think, I think there's something that we, and I don't know what that is yet. I think we have something special brewing, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I don't think that Petrino has unveiled everything offensively. I think you've seen sprinkles. And the more and more that, that you watch over these three games, he's been slowly hinting at what he's doing. That's why I said receiver by committee, running back com by committee. And when I look at it from a defensive perspective, I'm a defensive player. We study those guys. There's not really anybody who you can key on, which I think that's the key to what he's trying to do. It allows one -on more one-on-one -on -one opportunities with your playmakers. And I think that you're going to, you should see that continue into the Auburn game where we allow our playmakers to create plays, run open, and then eventually open up the run lanes uh, with, with, with the guys that we have on the outside by creating pressure uh, on defenses, man, to be able to play us man up, empty the box, and open up our run game that way. So I just think, man, we have the guy quarterback. Uh, I think the play caller is being strategic with what he's doing. I think there's a lot of optimism, man, with what we got going on offensively. Jordan, if you're an opposing defensive coordinator, right, and uh, Auburn's coming into this mm -hmm. game, well, what are they doing, knowing that Connor is playing at such a high level, the depth at the wide receiver group, do you take somebody out? How, how would you defend A&M if you're an opposing defensive coordinator? Ooh, that's tough. That, that's tough. What I would have to do is I'd have to create a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on A&M. Here's the one thing that Miami did. Miami showed me that I can get pressure on our offense. All right, until we fix that issue, I think that's what you're going to see. You have to be able to live with one on ones against our receiving core. All right. So you have to tell, you, if I'm a DC, you have to tell our DBs, listen, we need you to hold up for two to three seconds because we're bringing the pressure. I think until AM shows that we can uh, handle the pressure and handle the pressure consistently, that's what you're going to see a lot. I think you're going to see uh, Auburn dial up a lot. 
I think I see. I think you're going to see a lot of uh, pressures from the secondary, especially the safety positions, coming through uh, a gaps. The uh, a gap pressures, not a lot of outside pressures because up the middle is what killed us a lot against Miami, right? Uh, unblocked defenders, uh, linebackers shooting the A and B gaps. I think you'll see that a lot. So if I'm Auburn, uh, we're going man. We'll mix in some some zone dogs, some zone pressures as well. But we're going to be bringing more than you can block, and we're going to see if our athletes are better than your athletes. All right. So our I don't know how much of Auburn you've watched, and Miami certainly impressed me with their athletes and their will to win. How do Miami's athletes, in your opinion, stack up against SEC athletes? I think Auburn should be a little bit behind because of their rebuilding project. Yep. Yeah, I think I, what you saw from Miami was you just saw the speed factor. I think that's what you saw from Miami. I think overall, I think our line play is, is better. I think as far as our own D-line, we're, we're better. But you saw on the back end, uh, especially on their defensive side and their secondary, you saw the speed advantage that they had, and they used that to their advantage. I think that's why they created a lot of pressure on us because they felt that they could hold up on the outside. So if I'm Auburn and, and I see that tape, I know that right now we're a little behind in what in what we want to be as far as athlete acquisition, right? I need a few years with, with freeze. But if we can create pressure and if we can hide those deficiencies, man, I think that gives us a chance if I'm Auburn, right? So that's what I saw from Miami, man. I saw a lot of speed on that back end. There's still work they need to do up front. But I think, you know, we have the advantage moving forward on a lot of teams when it comes to the skill position. All right, so if Miami gave the blueprint on how to attack A&M and other teams are going to borrow that, A&M has yep. now been given the, the plans of what they're going to face. So how do they improve at blocking when they're going to bring more people than a and ready for? You empty the box and you force them to show what the blitz is. So I expect A&M to be in a lot, in a lot more uh, four receiver sets uh, two wide trips, formations, a lot of empty uh, looks um, because now you need the defense to show their hand. When you when you empty that box out, whoever the extra blitzer is or the add-on blitzer has to show their hand now, which allows us to declare what we, to declare what we want to do offensively. So I think you'll see us empty the box a lot more, which will open up a lot more, like I said, one-on-one -on -one opportunities with our outside guys with the vent wheel that will eventually open up the run game as well. That's why I said I think we need to have one guy who can, who can be an 80-yard uh, rusher for us, sing, uh, you know, single-handedly, because now you're creating a multiple facet on offense, and you're creating a rhythm once you establish what they're going to do defensively. So I look for more of empty sets, more of four wide uh, type formations out of us in order to get the defense to declare what they're going to do. Jordan, last thing for you: How many losses do you think Bam is going to have this year? Oh, Jalen, <laughs> Jalen Milrose question, back, man. right? So he's back, and I think he's an upgrade to what they saw, but he still has his issues. Here's what I think. Um, I think at worst, Alabama's a 9-3 team if they mold that offense around Jalen. I think against Texas, they did not use what he does well. He needs to be more of like a Lamar Jackson type style, zone read, uh, heavy, heavy RPO style quarterback. I think that's where he lives and thrives. But one thing that I said watching the Texas game is Jalen thrives in chaos. Every time that you saw a big play happen, um, uh, it was a lot of chaotic things that happened in the backfield, whether it was a drop, a drop snap, whether it was a fumble snap, whether it was an unblocked player. You saw him thrive in those moments. You also saw it against Middle Tennessee State. I think if you if you mold that offense to his strengths, his running ability, you give him uh, one read, possibly two on offense, now you see more of an explosive guy and you, and you allow him to be who he is. I don't think they're utilizing him right. And I think Nick Saban took that South Florida game to figure out can we have another guy? Can we have another guy fit the offense that I want to run? I don't think he wants to run that style of offense, but he's going to have to in order for them to be effective. Jordan, appreciate you, man. Talk to you next week. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Jordan Pugh on the hotline. We'll come back. Brandon Jones, our CEO, is going to chit-chat a little bit about uh, Texas Aggie United and a little bit more, and then afterwards we'll get an insider's perspective from the Auburn um, point of view. Right now we're talking about the Association of Former Students. How about you join them for the pregame party this Saturday before the Aggies beat the hell out of Auburn? Grab your friends and join Aggies from classes of 2011 to 2023 for Boots and Bourbon Young Alumni Weekend. The tickets are only $30 and are available for purchase at tx.ag slash YAW. The party starts at 9 a.m. They're going to feature Alvy's Boots, breakfast tacos from Cooper's Old Time Pit Barbecue, and specialty cocktails from Boots Beverage 
Barman Berman, Blackwater Draw Brewing Company, and DJ Bear. Enjoy the uh, party and a chance to win several prizes, including a pair of Albie boots, a Texas A&M noggin, and a Jimbo Fisher autographed mini helmet. Now, after the party, sit with friends at the football game by purchasing tickets to a reserve block of Young Alumni Weekend section. A link to the purchase and discounted football tickets will be provided in your tailgate ticket confirmation email. Don't miss out on the biggest party of the weekend. Tickets are available for purchase at tx.ag slash y. A.W. All right, we are back. Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here on the Rollo Insurance Studio. Brandon Jones in studio, Tex Ags CEO. Hello, Brandon. Hey, how are you? So when you come in the studio, yesterday you came in to talk to Billy. I was like, I told Billy, yeah. HR's coming. So is HR coming for me? No. no. Uh, they don't send me in. for. I'm not the HR guy that gets sent in. Okay. You know, that's Josh. When that's he a, shows up. Then it's, it's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so bring your playbook. That's typically not not what's going on when I enter the room. Although, you know what? It's almost every time Billy complains. If I open up that door when he's in here, she, he's thinking, I, you know, it's usually a question that's going to benefit him, right? And somehow he just can't. <laughs> he can't get over that. So, well, what we're about to talk about is something that's going to benefit a lot of people in this community. Let's talk about Texas Aggie United. Yeah, so Texas Aggies United, um, 
we're, we're excited about this new program. Okay. And so I, I want to say, um, for a lot of Texax people, this will just kind of feel like a rebranding of stacked. And that's not what this is. This is a much bigger picture about the entire Texas A&M um, market co collaborating on a single NIL entity. And so I think that's really key. If you look at what other markets are doing, uh, and what I mean is other collegiate markets, what they're doing with their collectives and their NIL, they're beginning to coalesce around single um, organizations that everybody is circling around and pouring time and attention and directing people to. And that's pretty key because I think for NIL to be successful, you need some efficiencies. Um, you need to have a common message in, in the market. You need to be able to start putting, putting in place efficient systems to, to fundraise, to activate you know, athletes, um, and, and create, uh, NIL opportunities for them. And so everybody in the market, if you're working together, that's going to be a lot easier to achieve. So while stat, uh, while Texag's subscribers might think that this is a, a simple step, you know, in kind of rebranding, it's a much bigger thing that over the course of the next 12 months, we're really excited about how this would mature out. Um, and everybody in the market kind of being able to come to the table <clears throat> and talk about, um, you know, value add stuff. Anyway, so that's, so that's Texas Aggies United. It is, it is the new collective or it's, it's taking some of the collectives that existed in the marketplace, them consolidating, us partnering with that collective in order to um, create a web presence, to provide administrative support, like just just think of like all the stuff like billing for right. members and stuff like that, um, <clears throat> and then uh, TechSag's also partnering to actually create you know activation points, content, live events, stuff like that. So, so, so what was known as Stacked will evolve into this, and it's just a part of a bigger picture. Yeah. So. Let's look at it this way. Um, Stacked was a purely a Texags initiative for Texags to begin to crowdfund for NIL among the, the Texags community. So Texags is coming to the table in the market and say, hey, um, let's create a bigger, um, let, let's, we're not the ones saying all this, but the, the market as a whole is saying, hey, let's all put into a common NIL effort. TexAg's contribution to that is, well, we've got this stacked program over here. Let's fold that in there to give it, to get us a start to a member base. And if you look at like stacked was three levels, mm -hmm. you could donate a hundred a year, 250 a year or a thousand a year. Um, and what Texas Ag is United is doing on an individual level is, is taking um, and really expanding out on what those different member levels and associated benefits are. And we take it from 250 a year all the way up to 50,000 a year right. and lots of different benefits in that. So it's, it's really growing um, <clears throat> what an individual can do. Um, and then the market kind of circling around and providing different benefits for what the giving appropriate given level is. Um, and then we also add the ability for corp for corporations to sponsor. So you could be a corporate sponsor and um, give anywhere from 5,000 to 50,000 on the corporate sponsor. And so um, that's actually new to, to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Now we, we've done some corporate sponsorships through Stacked, um, but my, I anticipate that a lot more organizations are going to want to get involved with Texas Aggies United. Um, it's the, the, the official um, NIL initiative of Texas A&M Athletics. And so it's got the blessing of um, A&M Athletics. And so I think there's going to be a lot of uh, brands that, that'll want to be a part of that. It's going to create additional content for us too, right? It's going to Abs give us some opportunity. Sure, absolutely. Um, we've we've really uh, 
the the stacked program has been great for us and it's been great for the fan you know we've been able to bring so many different athletes in here across all the sports and just get to know them mm-hmm. right that was a that was an that's a fairly new thing which is which is a little surprising to say like most fans don't really have that much access to the student athlete and so through the stack program we've been able to bring and sit down with tons of athletes um both for you know multi-part interviews and single interviews and just really introduce uh athletes to to the fan base texas aggies united is only going to grow that we're going to increase the number of of uh excuse me we're going to increase the content that we're developing Mm -hmm. both in the number of interviews and then also probably the style of content and stuff like that so we're definitely excited about that and then if you are already existing member of stacked Mm -hmm. you will be grandfathered into some of these changes that are happening yeah so um so again stacked was three levels and so the the 250 and the thousand um, dollar levels those just go right into texas aggies united there are membership levels at, at that contribution we're grandfathering in um, the hundred dollar a year level and Texas Aggies United won't be taking that forward. And that's, that's based on, and there's been some questions on Tex Ags about that. Why not? And that's just based on looking at the landscape out there. We went and we, we did a lot of research on what other collectives are doing in their respective spaces and trying to figure out like, what are those typical contribution levels that others are doing? And um, trying to reorganize Texas Aggies United so that it's it's more equivalent to what other markets are doing. And then if people want to get involved, um, they can start that at TexasAggies.com? Uh, actually, start that at TexasAggiesUnited.com. Okay, TexasAggiesUnited.com. Yeah, you can read more uh, about the program. There's a detailed uh, FAQ there so you know exactly what you're getting into. And then when you go to join... Um, there are eight different membership levels for individuals, and so you can look at all the benefits there. Um, the, the one benefit um, that I think I want to point out immediately is those giving $2,500 or more actually get an opportunity to direct those funds to a particular sport okay. or sports, right? Um, we'll respond with a worksheet, and if you want to give, you know, um, 25 to this sport, 25 to that sport, and 50% to another sport, you can do that. And so that's hugely helpful. Um, it allows people to, to actually get um, their money toward, you know, the, the, the athletes in respective sports. Anything we haven't touched on about this that you'd like to get out there? Um, yeah, let, let me just close with this. NIL is here to stay. Okay, at least for the foreseeable future. Until athletes become employees of athletic departments or sports teams or whatever, NIL is here to stay. Now, we can all complain about that or wish that it wasn't so, but that's just not reality. And so I think everyone needs to, be, to kind of get their head around that and try to figure out how can we support um, Texas A&M athletics uh, as it relates to NIL. And so Texas Aggies United is a perfect opportunity for that. Um, And it's what the market is kind of coalescing around. And we would encourage everybody to give serious consideration to it. Brandon, thank you, sir. Absolutely. Appreciate you. When we come back, we're going to get an Auburn insider's point of view on how their season is going and what to expect this Saturday at Kyle Field. But right now we're talking about the HD 13, the Hilliard Discussion 13 the ultimate recovery modality for performance. You want to certainly check that out. It is not your run-of-the-mill recovery techniques, guys. They're going to talk about many, many different things, such as uh, cupping, dry needling, shockwave therapy, cryotherapy. It's a lot of great content going to be happening here very, very soon, Thursday, September 21st, from uh, 5 to 8 o'clock in person at the Annenberg Presidential Conference Center at George Bush Library and Complex on the uh, Texas A&M University campus. Come early and meet all the people and enjoy it. It's going to be a fun event with a lot of great speakers like Dr. Heather Linden, physical therapist, senior director for the UFC. You've got Mr. Saul Luna, athletic trainer for A&M Track and Field. Dr. Joyce Terrell, athletic trainer at Morehouse. 
Dr. Reagan Suarez, physical therapist at Rice, and Major Evan Carson, physical therapist for the U.S. Air Force. You want to come check it out. It's going to be a great event. It starts at 5 o'clock, 5 to 5.30, the doors open. Meet and greet with Ms. Rev, 5 to 6.30, the discussion, and the 6.30 to 7 o'clock Q&A, 7 to 8, meet and greet. Go check it out. It's the HD 13, the Hilliard Discussion 13. All right, we're back. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Let's go to the hotline, joined by the voice of the Auburn Tigers, Andy Burkham here with us. What a great background, my friend. Good morning to you. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good. That's, uh, Sam, that's Sanford Hall at uh, sun, Sunrise. Looks beautiful. On the Auburn campus. Yeah. So <laughs> l- let's talk a little bit about this program, the vibe around them, A, considering the hire that they made months back, and then the start, which I know it's been against some, some lower-level teams, but when you are trying to get your program back, that's how you start things off to give you hope as SEC play comes. You know, it's really started since the day that Hugh Freeze was named the head coach back in November. Let me, let me go back even further. The last four games of last season, and I mean, last season was a, was a struggle, to be sure, at Auburn. And when Brian Harson was let go and Auburn named Carnell Williams, as the interim head coach. And for those four games, and one of those games included the A&M game at Auburn, Auburn started a move back at that point. Now, Auburn wasn't a great team, but there were just a lot of things about Carnell and that staff, what he did in that last four games. 
Then when Hugh Freeze was named the head coach, he retains Carnell Williams as associate head coach, really does a good job of putting a staff together, and then started his recruiting, one for this current team. And there's several new names that you're going to see on that Auburn roster and really transformed a roster, thanks in great measure, to the transfer portal. And then they immediately went to work on the 24 class and the 25 class. He talked yesterday, Hugh Freeze, at his weekly press conference about the next three teams on Auburn's schedule, Texas A&M, Georgia, and LSU. And those three teams are among the very best in the last several years as far as the recruiting numbers, the recruiting classes. And now Auburn's about to face those teams. And Auburn wants to get to that point. It's certainly on its way at this point. But he knows also the value of these great recruiting classes that Auburn's about to face with the next three teams. And I think the staff that he brought in and the recruiting that he and his staff have done since November have given Auburn fans, the Auburn family, a great deal of optimism going into this season. Auburn is 3-0, and wins against UMass at Cal, and then last week at home against Samford. It also knows that the schedule picks up dramatically <laughs> starting Saturday morning down in College Station. How I, I know that Hugh was very emphatic about the <clears throat> amount of talent A&M has, especially on the defensive line. Some of the results haven't been there over the last year and some change. Uh, the Miami loss still sings quite a bit here from a couple weeks ago. How does Auburn look at this matchup overall? Well, that that's one of them, the, 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 the line of scrimmage. And Auburn has been better with its offensive line this year. A lot of new faces of that offensive line, but it lost probably its most consistent offensive lineman last week in the win against Sanford and Cam Stutz, who was one of the few returners on that offensive line. And then also a junior college offensive tackle named Isavian. They call him Too Tall Miller. Both of those guys went out. Now, whether they will play this week, I think is a question mark for Auburn. So I think that's one reason that he looks at that defensive line at Texas A&M with an offensive line where he did not finish last week's game with his right tackle and right guard. And so I think that that gives him pause going in. Talk. But I think he also takes a look at, at the other side of the ball and what Cotter Wigman has done and that really good group of wide receivers with Anaya Smith and Evan Stewart and Moose Muhammad and others. It's a deep room and it's an athletic room. It's where Auburn would like to get with its group of wide receivers. And I think you're seeing that in the recruiting efforts moving forward. I think that's one of Auburn's big points of emphasis. Wide receivers, one. Offensive line, two. Andy, help me understand the way it works with the two-headed monster at quarterback. I mean, is it only run situations with Robbie Ashford? Is it, I mean, is, is he throwing a bit? Because that was one of the areas that I saw last year. I was like, I don't know about that. Uh, I'm, I know he can do it. He just didn't do it very much against AM. Just your, your thoughts on how that is working. The Cal game was, I think, a bit of an oddity for Auburn as far as the quarterback because neither quarterback performed especially well at Cal. And Auburn went to the two-headed monster probably more than would have liked to have done at Cal. And Auburn had one really good series offensively at Cal. Turned out to be the game-winning series. And, and in that series, Peyton Thorne was, was effective for Auburn at the quarterback spot. A week ago Monday, Hugh Free said, we, we can't continue to do that. We've got a quarterback. We, we can't alternate quarterbacks. And they didn't, and they didn't have to last week against Sanford. And then Robbie Ashford came in in the red zone a couple times. He is the best running quarterback that Auburn has. And then he finished off the game at quarterback and had a touchdown pass down the seam to a redshirt freshman uh, tight end, Micah Riley. Peyton Thorne, on the other hand, passed the ball effectively against Sanford, but also had 123 yards rushing. By far the most in his career, that includes his time at Michigan State as well. I don't see him being a 100-yard rusher moving forward for Auburn, especially when it comes to defenses like Auburn will face this week against Texas A&M. But it does give Auburn some options at quarterback, even if it's not Robbie, Robbie Ashford there. I do think that Robbie Ashford, when he comes in, is still more of a primary runner 
uh, for Auburn. He does have the ability to pass, and it's something that he has to continue to get better at doing. Talking to Andy Brookham here on Texas Radio, the voice of the Auburn Tigers. All right, you, you alluded to it earlier, but this stretch that's coming up, these three next games. Brutal. Uh, uh, Brutal. And that's life in the SEC, but for a team that is starting – um, their their SEC run. I mean, I can't think of a harder stretch to this. So, how important is this three game stretch to the overall success of the season? I think you can take any three games in the SEC for Auburn and, and say the exact same thing. I just think that these first three in the league are incredibly tough for Auburn with an A and M team that I still be, that I think people here, including this coaching staff, believes this A and M team is incredibly talented and take away the Miami game. And it has played like that. And even in the Miami game, there are times where you can look and say, well, that A&M team can still pass the ball. I mean, Connor Wigman's been good in all three games this year, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. At the quarterback spot for, for the Aggies. And then you have the defending national champs in Georgia coming in. And for the longest time, that was an incredibly even series down through the years of late Georgia has dominated the series with Auburn. And then Auburn goes on the road to tech or to LSU. And in doing so is trying to win. It's well, it the last time Auburn played at LSU was its first win in this century in Baton Rouge. So I think that's also why you look at these first three games in the league and you're like, Holy cow. These are really three very, very tough games to start SEC play. Again, with incredibly talented rosters, one being the two-time defending national champion in Georgia, and tough places to go traditionally in Texas A&M and LSU on the other side. Whether this, listen, I mean, these are, and Auburn will, will likely be an underdog in all three games going into this this three-game stretch coming up. And then, by the way, it's conference for Auburn until mid-November. So, you know, and it's the SEC West, and we all know that the SEC West is the best division in the best conference in this country, even though Georgia's on the other side. All that being said, I know most teams in the West look at this as an opportunity because teams look vulnerable. Teams haven't played to the level that we expect the Bama to play. LSU had an issue against Florida State that looked pretty good against Mississippi State. But really, the West does seem open. Is it open enough for some of the teams from last year that weren't in the mix to be in the mix? I suppose it is. I also think it's it's very possible that some of these teams in the SEC West, like an LSU or an A&M or an Alabama, put start to put things together right now. I mean, we are in a day and age where we overreact on Monday to what happened on the weekend. And then things can completely change by the time your team plays on Saturday. And LSU is a great example of that. Yeah. On opening night against Florida state, there were flaws in that LSU team. They looked pretty darn good last week in Starkville against an offense that has given them fits in years past. That is Andy Burkham, the voice of the Auburn Tigers. Andy, thanks so much for your time. I hope to see you here this weekend. My pleasure. It's going to be a warm one, I understand. Well, for us, it's not going to feel that warm because we've had 110 forever, and now it's kind of normal. <laughs> we'll see you there on Saturday morning, bright and early. Thank you, Andy. Take care, bud. Hey, take care. We'll see you. Andy Burkham, the voice of the Auburn Tigers. Right now, let's hit a break. Let's talk Caldwell Country Chevrolet, Highway 21 in Caldwell online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. This is a daily update. So yesterday, they picked up our vehicle. And they're doing some work on it, some service. Great stuff, man. It was such a simple process. Dylan took really good care of us. Whoever your tech is or salesperson over there, I just just know it's going to be great. It, they're going to take amazing care of you when you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet. We can talk about it in different levels, right? You've got the service for your vehicle that they do, top-notch work and top-notch customer service. Then you've got the whole purchasing of vehicle thing, right? When you're ready for a new car, Caldwell Country Chevrolet is the place to consider because they're going to give you a great value on your trade-in. Uh, and that's where it starts, right? Well, it really, it starts online when you look on, on CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com to see the vehicles you want. You step on the lot, you take your car out there, you get the uh, the trade-in value that they're going to give you, and then you find the car that you want, and you're going to be very happy with the selection, the service, and the entire experience when you go to Caldwell Country. It's about a 15-minute drive, Brian and Caldwell, short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with our good friends there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell online, CaldwellCountryChevrolet.com.
And we're back, Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. So I got my guy, Ethan Jones, here. And one thing I know about our stats guy, uh, he's doing a great job with the crew. You guys have put out some incredible content over the last week, so thank you for that. Yes, sir. One thing I can guarantee, though, is uh, your stats game is strong, but your NBA jersey game is even stronger. Here we go again. Another go. NBA jersey. Yeah, it's a rerun. I've done this one before. i got to get some more to, to mix it up. Well, it, it, it looks good. Where do you want to uh, take this ULM report? Uh, let's first do some general stats, and then I'm going to talk about some trends with cupcake games. Okay. Um, this was a great game offensively, 557 yards, the most they've had since 597 yards against Kent State in 2021. 20, also, the defense played pretty well, holding ULM under 100 passing yards. That's the eighth time Texas A&M has done this in the Jimbo Fisher era. And considering we were, our passing defense was so bad against Miami, this was, this was good. This was good to have. But one trend that I saw, at least this season, is cupcake games. So far in these cupcake games, which is like, you know, this year is New Mexico and ULM. Last year is Sam Houston State, App State, and UMass. In the past, we've seen A&M kind of struggle in cupcake games, not beat them as bad as they should. Right. Um, and the stats show this. But this year, they've destroyed that trend. Um, total yards in cupcake games this year, which is New Mexico and ULM, 484. Last year, 362. Passing yards, 338. Last year in Cupcake Games, 225. Uh, completion percentage Cupcake Games, 700. Or, sorry, not 700. 75.7. Last year, 63.5. Yards per play, 7.1. And then 6.6 .6 last year. And then the big one is points. 49.5 points in Cupcake Games this year. Last year, it was only 21.7. Like, we had that UMass game, only 20 points. Right. App State game, 14 points. So this year, at least, we're beating the teams we should dominate. We're beating them by a lot. Heck yeah. All right. What about some offensive stats here? we got about a minute left. Um, so there's some interesting offensive stats I saw. One is 10 different A&M players caught a pass in this game, which is the most since 11 different Aggies had a reception against Northwestern State in Jimbo's first game in 2018. And I think this just shows the depth of our receiver room, like good receivers and also our running backs can get passage, and we have good tight ends. So it's a really good thing to see. Um, also, Texan was great on third down, especially with Connor Wigman at quarterback. Wigman went 5 of 6 with 121 total yards and a rushing touchdown on third downs. And with Wigman under center, AM was 7 of 10 on third downs, 70%. Last year, AM was only 63% on third downs. So it's really, really good sign that we're completing third downs. My favorite stat you have on here, Connor, 6 of 8 on 20 plus yard passes. Yeah, we're passing the ball downfield with success, which is great. Ethan, great job, buddy. I know you put a lot of work into this. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, tomorrow on the program. I know we got a lot of stuff planned. I can't remember it, but I, I know that uh, we'll talk to John Harris and Coach G and the rest of the crew. All right, that's going to do it for Tech Sags Radio here. Oh, Bronny. Bronny will be here. On a Tuesday, we'll see you manana.